afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think we just ask uh, the remaining people. So we'll get started in the interest of time. I know uh, uh, it's a Saturday afternoon. So first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for joining, joining us. Uh, it may be wet, cold and windy outside, but hopefully with the quality of the uh, presenters and the discussion, it's going to be warm and shining in here. Um, so I just want to, uh, first off, um, introduce myself. My name is Alex Winch. I'm a domestic financing operator and purpose with the Global Fund uh, to buy ASTB and malaria. Um, I'm going to be uh, your MC for this afternoon, um, just guiding us through the, the discussions. The, the majority of the talking won't be me, so that's uh, probably good to hear. So, first uh, off to, on the agenda for today, um, we have uh, our colleague Dr. Lamboli from the NICU from SADC will be talking us through um, the African Union scale and declaration um, on domestic financing for health. Most of you probably turn up and wondered, you know, for those not involved, what does air uh, mean? What is air? Uh, um, so we'll be uh, Dr. Kumbanefi will be talking us through that and also on the uh, the process of national health financing dialogues um, that should have been uh, taking place in, in the region. Then we're going to pass over uh, for part one of the discussion to um, the team from Thinkwell, uh, who will be presenting um, some of the common challenges, key issues, and findings from health finance and scoping reports. Uh, they'll be uh, leading that, that part of the discussion. We'll then pass on to issues of kind of more health uh, for the money and uh, two of the kind of low key, um, key kind of hanging fruits, as it were, are often public financial management and strategic purchasing. So they'll be talking us through a 45 minute discussion on that with a panel. Um, and then we've got uh, the findings from the Kenya National Health Financing Dialogues will be led by our colleague, um, Regina Ombam from the EAC. Um, and we'll also pass on to uh, Dr. Kumaneki again to talk to the subject experiences before our last part of the um, afternoon to round it off from four to five will be uh, a discussion with uh, the development partners and with the ministries of finance um, so on how development partners uh, can be better partners to ministries of health and finance and support health finance and reforms um, and, and that will lead us off to five o'clock uh, this afternoon so without further ado uh, i'm going to pass over to dr lamboli from the NICU. Uh, Dr. Kumaneki is a medical doctor and public health professional with 15 years experience in research evaluation and, pu and public health programs in Africa. Um, he is our uh, Senate focal point for the implementation of the uh, African Union LM and is currently the senior program officer of HIV and AIDS and Senate Secretary. So, Dr. Kumaneki, thank you. Thank, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to take you through the presentation on the subjects of the ALM. Actually, uh, I'm going to give you just an historical background, but also the genealogy, what led us to the ALM. Uh, the slides is going to be a big, lengthy presentation, but otherwise it's worth it. Just to try to put you in the context and see which works has been done at regional level, at country level, and later on we have a Discussions oh, okay. on the oh, national health finance design, which has been identified as one of the means of trying to see how it's advocating and also leading to different forms. So, on the first slide, we have to see this is an interactive slide, which we oh. actually normally in this slide can say. Yeah, so in the slide, he's trying to show now the, to the total health yeah, expenditure it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. across <laughs> since 2019, 2020, looking at different continents and especially countries. As you can see on the big dots, the big dots showing <laughs> mainly China and uh, India, while the green dots are showing African countries. But what the difference you can notice that you see that China and India has been uh, progressively spending more on health, while in Africa it's been kind of stagnant in between past 20 years. It's true that we've made progress, but we haven't made enough progress to achieve uh, all the SDGs goals, but also to improve health of our populations. Hence, we need now 
uh, capital level to see which type of reforms, which efforts do we need to implement and to improve the health outcomes, but also uh, ensure sustainability of our health response. And you could see the health outcomes through like life expectancy and also some uh, issues such as uh, child mortality, maternal, uh, maternal mortality is also improved in the past 30 years. Uh, the rate you could see that in the sub Saharan Africa, classifying countries at different levels, like the low middle, middle income countries, the upper middle income countries, where the rates uh, lying just so deep, which was mainly affected early in the 2000s due to the HIV, where we had a uh, deep, especially in terms of life expectancy, which with uh, the availability of uh, the ART. Is shown, is shown a drastic improvement. And you could see that there's been progress, but the gap still remains between the upper middle income countries and, low, and the low income countries. So it shows that even within uh, Sub Saharan Africa, there is still deep gaps which are persisting depending on the country, and also showing that we are not progressing at the same, uh, at the same pace. When you look at the health expenditure in the past years, also, we somehow had some progress in terms of uh, it, it, it expenditure per capita, but if you look at the median on the right side of your screen, where it's still a 20 US dollar, which is very low, when you, if you have to compare what we have to put as countries and how we have to improve health on this continent, otherwise we are not going to achieve the SDG. The next slide shows the progress that we've made. Remember 2001 has been a year, the, the Abuja Declaration, Putting as a threshold of 15%, uh, at least 15% for the government to achieve the 15% of uh, uh, the, the, the domestic budget to be allocated to health. And as you could see, between 2000 and 2020, there's been few countries, and this is an interactive slide which shows uh, which progress we've made. Sometimes you see that some countries have been achieving those targets, but it's not consistent. You will see that we have. On the right hand, sometimes Madagascar is able to achieve South Africa, and then the next year you have Botswana. So you have different countries achieving, but as we move forward, none of the country has been consistently and sustaining to achieve the Abuja Declaration, which shows that we still have uh, some challenges as far as the Abuja Declaration uh, is concerned, uh, the percentage of total government expenditure on health. On the <clears throat> In terms of, uh, uh, on the next slide, we are also looking on the share of the total expenditure, how we've been performing. You could see that uh, even when you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the half of pocket expenditure, depends on whether it's a middle income country, a half a middle income country, low middle income country. And as we go down on the scales, you will notice that we have a higher expenditure on half of pocket expenditure, which shows that we still have a long way to go. We still have uh, to make a lot of effort in terms of protecting our people from uh, financial hardship due to health expenditure. So this slide is a speech. Of the budget is going. In most cases, in most analysis, when you look at the economic growth, it doesn't follow. Uh, the prioritization is not really used. Uh, health has not been prioritized by government. The health expenditure mainly grows because the economy is growing. There's uh, the envelope which is allocated by the government to economy and uh, to health is growing just by the fact that we have now more available in the countries. But in terms of 
prioritization in terms of so making healthy government priorities we haven't reached that level. So hence we need more advocacy, more uh more 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 support to the government to see how government can prioritize health and consider health as an investment, not as an expenses, because that way we are standing now. In most cases, when you analyze, you see that when you call the politicians, we are mainly considering health as an expenditure instead of considering health as an investment. This is where we need a paradigm shift. So it's important that as, as health economists, as uh, professional, public health professionals, continue advocacy, continue discussing, engaging the decision makers to see how best we can show that health should be considered as an investment. On the next slide, we are looking at the expenditure. You will see that the effective health uh, coverage by expenditure level. There are so many inefficiencies. On the slide, I'm sure if you could see uh, some countries such as Rwanda and Ivory Coast, where you, you have some kind of discrepancy, we are spending much, and also there's also some kind of also uh, improvement in terms of universal health coverage. Why, when you look at countries such as Ivory Coast and the dots there in the middle, you note that Ivory Coast is spending a lot of money that UHC is not following. So, just to tell you that spending more doesn't mean that we are reaching UHC. We need also to strategize. You need that strategy thinking at national level. Hence, you see uh, during those are the discussions that we engage with the government, with different stakeholders when we go for the national health financing dialogue, when we are implementing, trying to talk about the ALM. So, now given that background, what has been the progress? How do we? Uh, countries been working at continental level and regional level, but also national level. When you look at in 2001, as you said, that has been a milestone year with the Abuja Declaration, requesting that 15% uh, of budget, the, the, the local, the national budget, should be allocated to health. Following that, we all know that this actually before most countries are not achieving the target or even those who have achieved the target are not consistently are not consistent they are still there are still jobs whereby country cannot maintain that's uh, 15 percent allocation in 2016 there's been uh, the, 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 the the health african scorecard on health financing which has been developed this was a tool which was requested by the au by the head of state to be appraised to be updated on how we are doing as far as financing is concerned regarding the airport. As you see, the scorecard has been uh, used mainly to inform the high level, uh, the head of state, and team, and show them how countries are doing and which effort can we can we do. But three years later, three years later, have, what has been noted? The, yes, the scorecard is given, but the scorecard does not tell us what to do. The scorecard did not tell us how did not advise countries on which steps that could be taken in terms of improving that financing. Hence, we came with the ALM, the African Leadership Declaration in 2019. In the African Leadership Declaration, as you could see, you are going to see that there has been 10 commitments. The commitment has been mainly around developing what we call the tracker, the tracker, which is a tool we, uh, which would help countries not only to diagnose the health financing and the health economy situation, but also advise countries on the key step and the key intervention to take to improve the health financing landscape. In 2020, there's been agreement in terms of hosting the hub, mainly in Eastern uh, Africa and uh, also Southern Africa. And in 2001, we've been now negotiating with ALM, sorry, with the AU, and the AUDMA part in terms of modernity and practicability for implementing the ALM. In 2022, we had the first national uh, dialogue, which was in Malawi in October 2022. And that was the So the choice of great different countries, in, as you could see, you have lower middle income country, you have upper middle income countries such as Mauritius. It's also to give evidence to help countries and also to inform other countries on what are the key interventions that you could use in terms of uh, 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 using an, an African experience and also helping each other in terms of improving the health financing dialogue. So those are, have been the key 
moment we see achievement uh, for us to improve what we call the health financing situation landscape in the region. Yes, so uh, in terms of, so I'm saying those are the key, uh, the key achievements which has been done in terms of uh, having the national dialogue, but also after the dialogue, we are not stopping there. I think there will be more explanation on the dialogue by Regina. I do, I do not want to preempt that, but the dialogue has been an opportunity also to discuss on the different issues at countries level and also regional level. This shows just the African score card as in, it has been developed since 2016. I think now we have the last edition, which is the score card uh, five, which is available on the seat of the AU, which shows how countries have been performing. I think the last score card is, is summarizing the health expenditure in 2021 exactly. So to see how countries have been performing. And when you look at on your website on the right side, you see that there's been not really great progress, but few countries have started uh, try, trying to improve the, 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 the how the output of the scorecard. Then this shows just what the ALM meeting, which I was just talking about, and uh, in terms of what has been the commitment and the ALM in summary is mainly four, it's mainly around four objectives, four key objectives which are more money for him in terms of how do we mobilize more resources, domestic resources for health in, in countries in Africa. The next objective is more help for money, which still speaks to issues of efficiency, issues of allocation between countries, and the issues of governance. Governance is one of the key elements. Remember, when you go to different countries, when you do assess regional economy community, which are mainly ESC and SADC, where we have started, but uh, we are also looking at now involving the ECOWAS and the ECAS towards implementation of the ALM in those regions. Yeah. Like different partners, such as the UN partners, WHO, UNAIDS, who are actively working with us. We also have other partners, such as ODI and Pinpoint, which have been supporting us through this journey in terms of analysis, in terms of background documents, and so forth. So, uh, one in implementing the ALM, we have the regional health financing hub, as I mentioned. Those are structures which are supporting the implementation, not only for the dialogues, but also post dialogues uh, activities in providing technical support in those different countries. We, uh, the truckers, I'm not going to talk much about the trucker because we have spoken about it. This is just how the trucker looks. We have, this is an instrument, as I said, we uh, 20, mainly 23, 12, sorry, 12 indicators which are targeting mainly the key, around the four key objectives of the ALM. We have many more money for help when we see what, uh, like, for example, which change in tax report has been done over the past year, which shows you uh, how the government, which effort the government is doing in terms of increasing the health budget or allocation to health. We uh, also have some few indicators which are looking at issues such as more uh, health for the money in terms of uh, <clears throat> the percentage of health spending allocated to primary health care. So these are looking at issues of efficiencies. We are also targeting equity and uh, uh, the country leadership, the governance, which looks at how the Ministry of Health is working with the Ministry of Finance, how different stakeholders such as the private sector, the civil society, and development partners are working together towards improving the health financing uh, landscape in the country. So the next slide, uh, speaking to the, what we call the National Health Financing Dialogue. In the National Health Financing Dialogue, we, this is a platform uh, which we use to initiate and mobilize different stakeholders to discuss on uh, the issues of health financing and also agree on the key actions to address different challenges and gaps which we are seeing through the process. So this is a platform where we have the government within different stakeholders. We have uh, the private sector, the development partners which are coming together to come and discuss. This is a process mainly led by the government. And during uh, the, the process, we, we have first what you call the free dialogue which engage uh, different stakeholders, um, different stakeholders first in the 
we will discuss the old issues and then on the last uh, on then we have what we call the dialogue where stakeholders come together and also agree on the main issues and opportunities and also the key actions to be uh, to be to be taken to address the health financing issues. I'm trying to go a bit, but so the the process of the national health financing dialogue it works around the theory of change. We first start by an assessment. The assessment is through an analysis of the financial landscape and also uh, on uh, looking at what are the opportunities that we could use and uh, how could we advise the the the, 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 the government. And uh, through that uh, process of assessment, it helps us in building evidence. So we need to build evidence. We need to advise government on what is possible, what is feasible within the fiscal space, within the possibility of the government. And also, uh, once we have done that, the discussion will be turning around what, what activity or what, what could be, uh, how can you say, it? what can be first prioritized in terms of activity, in terms of reforms, to help uh, improving the health financing landscape in the country. So um, the, as I mentioned earlier, we had a number of countries which have had the dialogues, I think three countries in the SADC region and one in the ESC region. In the SADC, we are more likely, we will be heading next week in Mozambique and in September, it's going to be Mauritius. And other countries have also requested, such as Namibia, Madagascar, and Tanzania. While in Kenya, we are during the last quarter of the year, we'll be having Rwanda and Burundi also holding the national dialogue. So with that, this will be my last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you to Dr. Kumbaneki there uh, for a really uh, rich and, and, uh, and an excellent presentation about the ALM. I think we'll have, if there's a few questions, maybe just uh, pass over a few quick questions for the audience. There's a lot there in the slides. Um, yes. And if you could just introduce yourself and, uh, and, and, uh, and your question. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is um, Abba Rimo. I work for After Sessions. Yes, um, so uh, thank you so much to the presenter. I uh, really like the way you presented um, those background data. It gives um, a good understanding of the situation of things. And uh, one thing I would like to say is that, um, so would they do, if we keep repeating what we are doing, we might not get um, the kind of um, results that we're expecting. And um, one way that we can improve um, more resources um, for the health sector is probably to approach health financing from a whole of government approach yeah. rather than look at it um, like a um, health sector and use of finance kind of thing. Because um, the, the reality on the ground is that resources are scarce and government have to um, prioritize many other things and not just the health sector. Um, most of the people in the government want to win elections. So um, as much as we want more resources for, for health, there is also competing demands from several other things. But if we, if we sort of um, reorient our thinking a little bit and um, look at several other sectors of government and see how we can move some of these responsibilities that the health sector is taking on that can actually be in their budget, then we begin to look at what is the Ministry of Transportation, for example, contributing, what is the Ministry of uh, Water Resources, and so on, contributing um, to health. And in that way, um, we, even though it's in those various, um, in those various budgets, uh, we, if we bring all of it together, we start to increase um, allocation to health. So one thing I'd like to suggest um, um, for these meetings is to sort of broaden the scope and not limit it to Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Health, that to take the whole of government approach where we are bringing in um, as many uh, as many health sector stakeholders um, into into the room. And my second um, question is with regards to um, is with regards to the to the to how you are engaging um, politicians even more broadly. Because, like I said earlier, uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of competing needs, and if we want to increase these resources, then we must um, broaden what we do and sort of take a more political economy um, approach to it. 
And if we are looking at it from the political economy perspective, then it means that we need to engage even more politicians, not just heads of states and so on, the political parties and so, so that we make health an agenda for the party rather than an agenda for a particular administration. And that we will be able to sustain on these kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe one extra just from the uh, quick last, last one. Mary, just one. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Oluwa Fusi from Health System Responsibility of Nigeria. Um, so just to lay on what um, you just spoke to, how to approach it from two perspectives. First, from the political economic perspective. Um, there seems to be a lot of technical discussions when we engage the decision makers, which doesn't resonate very well with them. And this is a very common error in a lot of LMICs. We go there with beautiful data all over there that does not really resonate with connecting the dot between his health and expense or is, an, or is it an investment. And I think the start point should actually be for the little advocation that has been given to health. What results are we actually showing for these advocations? If we start from this, we can do this trend analysis and show them over the years how this has moved a little. It might actually help us in engaging them with the mind of the conscience and then bring it down to a very low level, granular level of the language. Most times, we is a great disconnect, even with the Federal Ministry of Health at these LMICs. What we're speaking from the um, um, health economics perspective is totally at variance with what they, is their understanding. So we need to really come back home. Um, we need to also bring in um, stakeholders who will help with the tracking and speak on behalf of the people. So the civil society organizations need to have a very good, great role and be present at the table where decisions are being made. Are there are a couple of other things I think I will engage Doc much later, but I think there is a lot that we need to also uh, in achieving this. It's not just the 15th percent, also the aspect of the context of the country is very important. The gaps are various. Um, what 15% speaks to in terms of the coalition between 15% of allocation to the GDP of the country also needs to be aligned. And these are very, I think, very germane concerns that we need to talk about. Thank you. Thank you for those, uh, those excellent questions. I think, um, so on the, the, for the first, the question on, on, on stakeholders and certainly the engagement of politicians, later on, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Omman talk about the Kenya experience. And I think bringing the parliamentarians into the room and broadening that discussion beyond just those working in the health sector is, is one of the areas that's going to be covered there. So I think it would be great to, to maybe we'll, we'll defer that question for a bit later. Um, and then I, I, I just wanted to also maybe reflect on the, on the second um, question and ask Dr. Dr. Kuman if you maybe to respond on, on that one. Um, because I, I think one of the, what, what the, the issue is uh, that, that has kind of come out very clearly is that it's not a, a technical issue this, this issue on health financing, but it's about how do you, the process of engaging with the different stakeholders and educating actually as well. So maybe you can talk a little bit to that through the free guidance. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much for those questions. I think these are very important questions. I think both of them are speaking mainly to the same issues of political economy. And as mentioned by Alex, when we approach a country or when we start the process of the dialogue, we are not looking at the technical aspect of it. We are mainly looking at different stakeholders. There are meetings which goes, uh, like when you're talking about the political economy, you mainly look at the parliamentarian. In each and every country, we have that health commission or the health commission in the parliament, which address the issues of health. So the parliamentarians are involved into the process. At the government level, we have each and every government, which is an input into the health sectors. Because remember, when we are talking about health expenditures, not only the Ministry of Health, you have, in, depending on the countries, in a country like Zimbabwe, you have the Ministry of Labor, which takes, I think, the issues of uh, insurance. When you go to another country like Malawi, we have, we have the Ministry of Local Governments being involved. So depending on the specific local and on the specific context, the, the national context, we bring the main stakeholders who needs to be on board on the table and discuss. And lastly, the last discussion that we had, like in Mauritius, we even had the Ministry of Environment coming in because they had some inputs in the ministry into health financing. So 
oh, that's why you see we work with different, we have that background paper, the analysis for us to understand exactly who are the key players. And when it comes to politics, you know, when it comes to politics, it's, it's a sensitive issue. You don't have to dig into too much in countries, in the political divide in country. You just need to stick with the official one. And then you get opportunity also to have the civil society, which is playing a big role. Because in the free dialogue, we engage thoroughly with the civil society. And on the di national dialogue, we have also the civil society making a statement and looking at how they put, they can support the government. So there, there are a lot of engagements which are going on discussions, but I think your input are great, which should really also should be considered when we go to the next country and we continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and thanks for the uh, response, Dr. Dr. Lamboli. Um, Dr. Lamboli touched on the four pillars of the ALM, more money for health, more health for the money, governments and leadership and financial risk protection. And now we're going to um, kind of move on to talk about what that means for some of the countries where the dialogues have been uh, have taken place um, or, or plan to be taken place. And, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Kamenecki said, every dialogue needs to be evidence informed, evidence um, that so uh, a solid base of summarizing the current evidence, the gaps, the opportunities, and the policy gray areas to help inform those discussions is really important. To help do that, we've got our colleagues from Thinkwell, um, and so I'll pass over to Marcelina Islam, uh, who will lead that, that discussion. Marcelina is a program director with Thinkwell, uh, based in New York. Dr. Islam is an economist with over 20 years of experience working in the US, Asia, and Africa. So she leads Thinkwell's portfolio of activities with the government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Great. Thanks so much for that. And we'll really build off of on what Dr. Lamote presented. That was an excellent uh, presentation with lots of great data. We won't present quantitative data here, uh, we really will talk about very specific country context and country experiences, and really want to treat this as a discussion as a panel session. Um, so I'm sorry that it's not a V-shaped or U-shaped or round table, but we'll try to make the most of it so it looks like a discussion. What we wanted to do uh, is really talk about what the technical evidence is, while we talked about political economy being key, the national dialogues are about building on the political strength of the country. We all know that it needs to be based with very specific technical and programmatic evidence. So what we have here are two of our great country experts who are gonna present very specific country context issues. Let me introduce them first. Dr. Han Musava is a health system specialist with over 15 years of experience working with both public and development sectors. She's currently Thinkwell's regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa, and she's based in Kenya. Her work focuses on financing reforms to strengthen primary healthcare with a focus on primary healthcare funding mechanisms. We've been talking about that, financial flows to primary healthcare facilities and strategic purchasing reforms at both national and subnational levels. We could go to that slide, yeah. Oh, okay, all right, great. Um, the, our second panelist here is Dr. Mary Jan, and where's this, who went off? Jose, who's the health economist with, again, over 15 years of experience in health financing in Africa and the Caribbean. She's Thinkwell's country director in Burkina Faso, where Thinkwell supports mechanisms to improve financing and purchasing arrangements targeting primary health care again. Her work includes strategic facilitation with government and development partners in the health sector to explore opportunities from improving domestic health financing. And from them, we really will hear about key health financing context in those countries. To set the stage and provide some high-level technical uh, themes, we have um, Sven, um, Sven Engels, who's our senior technical advisor for health financing. He's based in Geneva with Thinkwell. 
And he supports activities in several countries, including Burkina Faso, Kenya, Pakistan, and the Philippines, as well as our work in Mozambique for this uh, national financing dialogue that Dr. Lamboli mentioned. So Sven is gonna draw on that work. We'll, I'll mention what we did in just a minute. Previously, Sven worked with the Health Policy Unit at ILO in Geneva and Thailand's Health Intervention and Technology Assessment Program. So if we can go to the intro slide for a second, um, you know, we heard about the ALM Declaration, we heard about the National Health Financing Dialogues as a platform. I just want to quickly mention that ThinkWell supported uh, this work with three technical scoping reports, health financing assessments that Dr. as Dr. Lamboli mentioned, health financing landscapes, really digging deep on compiling the evidence that already exists, but also bringing in new evidence from the work that ThinkWell and other partners are doing in these countries. So the countries we worked in are Kenya, Mozambique, and Burkina. So the two of the countries are represented here. And Sven will talk a bit about our evidence from Mozambique. And really the scoping reports, I hope you'll have a chance to look at them. Those of you who are really interested in some of this, dig deep into each of the four health financing pillars that Dr. Lamboli mentioned. We won't have time to go into all the four pillars in detail, but we're gonna to touch on some highlights that I think will resonate with most of you in the room uh, because these issues and challenges repeat over and over. So what we wanna to do today as a focus, we talked about this at length yesterday, is not harp on the challenges and the issues because we know they're common, you've been hearing them all day. We wanna talk about the opportunities that we are trying to build on and hopefully Dr. Lomboli and the Health Financing Dialogues uh, and the ALM work will build on in terms of the opportunities to improve some of these situations, how do we end this? So with that note, the way we're gonna do this is do two uh, sessions, two rounds of this session, with Sven introducing two pillars first, the themes around two pillars, and then Marjan and Anne, I will pose a couple of questions around those two pillars, and then we'll come back, Sven will present the other two pillars, we'll do another round with Dr. Marjan and Dr. Anita. So with that, I'm turning it over to Sven to present and go through the first two pillars, thank you. Thank you, Monserina. Um... Yeah, so I'm not going to make that happen in front of you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Fenning Holt. As much as Nina said, I, uh, I'm a principal advisor on health financing at Thinkwell. Um, I've been engaged in some of the scoping reports we've done and just really touched upon the evidence that Dr. Lombardi said I have provided on build evidence and application. Um, right? So, really thinking around what this is going to what evidence can we provide to stakeholders for them to build their discussion on. So, based on the four pillar logic behind the ALM declaration. I'm going to recite this one ahead. So, more money for health, more health for the money, um, equity, and uh, governance and coordination. I'm going to run through the first two right now. So, um, the first bit around more money for health. Now, the issues that are identified here are issues that we have found common across these three countries. Um, I'll present, I'll give specific examples for individual countries, but that doesn't mean that this is an issue that is exclusive to that country only. It just brings all other tests. Uh, uh, so first, when we look at domestic health financing, the, the core tenant, the ALM pillar, um, well, we've seen a significant increase over the past decades. We've seen a decrease in donor funding, but we've seen, especially government in many countries, coming up and really uh, increasing their contributions to the health sector. Great. Um, however, we also see, especially in the current times, severe fiscal constraints in many countries. Borrowing costs are going up. We have the case of Mozambique and Burkina Faso. Mozambique has an economic crisis, a debt crisis, Burkina Faso, political instability. All these things complicate, uh, complicate increasing domestic health finance and they reduce fiscal space in general. Um, we also see a reliance on external funding still, despite increasing government funds. Um, so it remains a significant source. However, it's unpredictable, right? We're dependent on someone else to provide free money, and it's often earmarked, which can be great in some sense as if you know what the money is going to, but it's also challenging as a government when you're trying to think around how do I use my resources efficiently towards the priorities that I have in my country. Um, so we've also seen some evidences of crowding out government spending in some areas. 
Uh, but this is a uh, Mozambique where um, we introduced several stakeholders and some of them, especially at the district and provincial level, they felt that in discussions with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance, that their budget requests were often revised downwards if the donor had committed a large amount of resources in their region. So a challenge to consider, right? Because this, the government funding would be not going to necessarily, and yeah, it's a challenge that we um, see. The final uh, challenge we found or finding is the quantification of how budgets mean. So we see in many countries that there's no complete overview um, of spending. So I've taken the example of Kenya here, which has a default system of governance, and um, basically there's no actual uh, complete overview of what's being spent by each and every country. This complicates planning. Um, this uh, just makes it unclear. The lack of evidence therefore influences the decisions that we can make based on our budget. Uh, a final point that has come across in many countries, I'm sure this is familiar to you as well. Health budgets are not based on evidence, they're based on historical spending levels. Um, so, in the case of Mozambique, yes, there's no evidence, there's very little evidence being used, and it's just, just based around what has been happening in the past year. Okay, so that being said, I'll quickly move on to the second thing. Yes, sure enough. So, this is around more health for the money. So, what is the money? A limited amount of fixed amount, how do we use that as efficiently as possible? So, this is allocated to decisions that come in here. Um, so, first of all, we looked at Burkina Faso, Kenya, and Mozambique. Um, we have a common topic of decentralization of health system. And how does that impact, impact efficiency? Well, one point we found is that, for example, in Kenya, we have seen inconsistencies in the cost of delivering care across the country. So a recent study by the Ministry of Health found that for a defined unit of health output, it ranged from 236 in one district to 4,921 troops. So nearly a twenty-fold uh, variation. So that's really significant, right? It's looking at how the resources spent and what are we getting out of it. And if we have a twenty-fold uh, variation in that, we need to be able to address that to at least understand why. Um, decentralization also has impact on purchasing of living arrangements. Now, they obviously mentioned the example of Kenya, whose NHAF alone, the National Health Insurance Fund, operates over 70 different groups. Then, looking towards allocated efficiency, well, uh, we say that in many countries, purchasing is mostly packed and in input based. Uh, this is the case in uh, Mozambique. Um, there's very few incentives being used for the public health budgets. And again, this lower more allocation to see how it's used. Um, all three countries also spend a significant portion of their health budget on salaries and equity. Um, we've been in a meeting this morning where we had a discussion around donor funds being used for commodities, and then you know, the question around who's paying for HRH. Well, maybe we have our answer here. Um, the data we have seen in Burkina Faso around half of the government's budget for health is spent on wages. Uh, similar in Kenya, the county level, we found evidence that around three quarters of the health budget is spent on wages, and in Mozambique, over half of domestic health expenditure is spent on wages. So, over half of these wages that we see here. It's very interesting. Um, the last point I will touch upon here is the availability of evidence to inform decision making. This is, of course, across, across the, uh, the topics we've seen, but um, you can only Build your, build your decisions on the evidence that you have available to you. In the case of the health system, we've seen that health information systems are not always consistently set across countries. The example of Burkina Faso, where specific health schemes of the Ministry of Health or NGO administrative schemes operate their own monitoring dashboards, but there is no way that connects them all. There's no one who has complete access to all the information, and this distorts the link between evidence and decision making. I'll end it here and I'll pass it back to Mozilla. Great, thank you. We'll come back to the issue of data um, in the second round a bit more, but I will mention here that there's more and more talk of digital PFM platforms, right? We know DHIS2 and the DHIS system has more or less helped us cover service delivery and service utilization data in most of our countries. And even if there are vertical programs in some countries, the data tend to come together, and there's been a lot of work on the service delivery side. On the financial data side, there's been less work, and we know more and more that the data systems are fragmented. So I do hope we can have a discussion towards the end about what we can do more 
on the data and the results yet. Um, uh, moves. For now, I'll come back to these first two pillars. Maybe uh, Sam, if you can go to the slide on the first pillar so that that's up. And I'll ask Marijan to kick us off with uh, some insights from Burkina Faso on resource mobilization. If you can talk a little bit about the macroeconomic outlook, the implications for health financing, and the potential for future reforms, of course, in the context of what's going on in the political economy in Burkina Faso. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Yeah, as uh, Sven mentioned, uh, the Minister Mokisho, we all are aware that we know the domestic or uh, political developments in Burkina Faso, and uh, this creates uh, the challenges we want to go through. And uh, with those uh, two elements, and as you know, our economy was not great before this uh, situation. But with those uh, two elements, uh, we have an important, like a huge uh, fiscal deficit. Currently, we are 7.8% um, of GDP for the West African Economic uh, Union. Uh, it was advised to be at 3%, so it's a big problem for us. Um, as you can guess, uh, we have a reduce of fiscal space um, for health and for more, uh, most of the development uh, sector. But because we are in this uh, security situation challenge, the government has to invest more, you know, uh, forward or defense and security related expenditures, so which reduce, you know, the, the space for development sector. Um, this is one of our realities, so we have now less money for development sector, including the health sector. But in addition to that, owing to the ongoing uh, political development, we have uh, some international and regional institutions which have suspended the support of the country. Uh, you know, large budget support is uh, uh, for most of the donors is suspended, but even borrowing money uh, from um, regional institutions, international institutions, which are the institutions. Um, I think the time is which is not actually before is very difficult for the country. So um mobilizing money uh in the country is a bit challenging, um uh, very challenging in fact. Um so the government is trying to do what it can it can do, but nevertheless, we have seen some increase with the little uh, flexibility that we have in the country. Uh, we move, we are now, now it's estimated at 30% uh, of uh, general government expenditure, the portion that goes to the health sector. But given our current situation, we are all hoping that the situation will improve. We are planning to have elections next year, so we will hopefully go back to a democratic uh, system, and that will give more opportunity to have uh, support, or uh, budget support, or also more money. Uh, from uh, regional institutions. So we hope that, that in the next, I don't know, next year, the situation will be better. But in the meantime, the government tries to do what it can do, uh, which is still um, a bit so difficult for the health sector, but hopefully for the health sector for most of the Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Marija. And one of the things that you mentioned yesterday is that the 13% now and then the 7% not that many years ago. So that's almost doubling of the health uh, budget as a percentage of uh, total um, government budget, which is amazing. That doesn't happen in many countries. So hopefully, uh, as you mentioned, it's an example of country that was really on a good trajectory for health financing and resource mobilization that suspended, stagnated for now, but what support and ideas can we bring in that will pick it up again when the political situation improves. So on that note, we'll then go to um, a different and and if you can talk a little bit about how decisions around resource allocations are made in the Kenya context, which is the scoping report that uh, we supported. Um, are allocation decisions evidence-based? 
what do we know about efficiency? Over to you. Thank you, Musalina. Um, in Kenya, when you talk about resource allocation, we can look at this in terms of different levels and different purchases, right? So you have the Ministry of Health, you have the sub national level, that's the county government, and then you also have the National Health Insurance Fund that controls about 15% of total health expenditure. So from the national level to the counties, um, counties, about 66% of expenses at county level is from the national level, you know, through a, a conditional block grant, what we call the equitable share um, in Kenya. And how these resources are allocated from national level to the county uh, is through an evidence-based nine-point um, um, criteria that takes into account, for example, uh, poverty levels, geography, um, health status, and population size. So in that sense, that, that is um, evidence-based. Now, when you look at how counties then allocate these resources that they receive to health facilities or to different um, um, you know, services at, at, at county level, a lot of this allocation is historical, um, and it's mainly through input-based financing. So for example, human resources for health, uh, supplies, and so on. Um, when you look at our third uh, purchaser, that's the National Health Insurance Fund, um, we're increasingly seeing the NHIF using data uh, in how they allocate resources. So for example, the NHIF has moved from a historical, from a historical way of uh, paying for services for past year to now, you know, they, they have many other provider payment uh, methods. A few years ago, for example, the NHIF um, wasn't paying, for example, for non-communicable diseases, um, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. But looking at data that NCDs, including cancers, are increasingly a uh, leading cause of morbidity and mortality, we've seen now the NHIF um, change the benefit package or expand the benefit package to make sure that they're also addressing um, NCDs. That said, um, there are still significant opportunities for enhancing how data is used um, to allocate resources across all levels of the health system and NHIF. So for example, right now, if uh, God forbid I had cancer, the NHIF would pay for my radiology, uh, I mean, um, radiotherapy, chemo, and so on. But NHIF still does not pay for um, diagnostic services or prevention services and so on. Yet all our policy documents are talking about a focus on prevention, but we're not quite seeing that translating to how resources are being um, allocated. You also asked about uh, efficiency. And Sven mentioned earlier that um, you know, the NHIF has over 70 pools for over 70 schemes. So for example, we have the main scheme that we call the super cover. Um, we have a high school student scheme um, called Edu Asia. We have a different scheme for pregnant women. We have a scheme for the elderly population above 70 years. There's a different pool for the poor and vulnerable. And they all have different benefit packages. And this obviously leads to a lot of fragmentation, different coordination structures, and so on. So there are discussions in Kenya right now about how do we harmonize um, all these over 70 pools, um, you know, uh, to ensure that then we're also gaining uh, efficiencies from that. The other significant area of efficiency is around human resources for health. So Sven mentioned that at county level, 77% of the county health expenditure budget is actually spent on human resources on paid salaries. Um, but a survey done in 2018 in Kenya so that absenteeism rate of 53%. So on the one hand, we are here talking about, uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, data we need to increase our health budget, but 53% of the staff are actually uh, absent. And so there's a significant opportunity there to improve productivity of our health um, workforce, which is constituting the bulk of our, of our health budget. Um, Sven also mentioned in his report the differences that we see between counties in efficiency level, uh, ranging all the way from $2 per unit of output to about $40 per unit of output. And that's even when you control for factors such as population density and so on. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity um, in Kenya for counties to learn from one another um, to really realize efficiency gains. Thank you. Back to Musali. Good timing on this first round. Um, I hope that was interesting. And we will come back to some of these issues. And Dr. Lomboli um, and Alex, as we talk about the national financing dialogues, 
it's not just the financing mobilization, right? We talked about allocation, it's human resource issues. We've heard about absenteeism for decades. What can politicians, members of parliament and others do with this issue until, unless we can resolve some of this and add more prevention, uh, add more preventive services, allocate more financing towards prevention services, it's very difficult to move forward with the health outcomes we want. So on that note, we'll move to pillar three and four, and Sven will uh, take us through those quickly, uh, the big themes, and we'll do another round with the country evidence. Finance that would need to be a cost center included in the budget. And then the, the strategic purchasing community would think of paying a provider, whereas the Ministry of Finance would think of formulating a budget. But these aren't necessarily actually different concepts. It's just different language used for similar concepts. There's a bit more than semantics, but beyond that, it is just different language. And they also share very similar objectives, and that's to improve the efficiency and quality of public spending and link resource allocation to well-considered evidence-informed policies and plans. And indeed, strategic purchasing actually enables ministries of health and ministries of finance to align around common goals and health priorities, and then actually mobilize more funding if the Ministry of Health can show that it is linked the money that it receives to better health outcomes. And that's what strategic purchasing does very effectively, and that this money is well spent. And they also have a lot to learn from each other, these two communities. The Ministry of Finance on the one side doesn't necessarily understand very well what sectors require from it and from the PFM system, and some of the intricacies and re special requirements of the health sector there isn't necessarily enough engagement on this. And I think that's what the National Health Financing Dialogues are doing very well, is bringing these two bodies together, but maybe slightly less emphasis on the PFM side. And from the Ministry of Health's perspective or the PFM community's perspective, there's also a lot that can be learned from PFM reform and the many, many decades of hard-won battles and learning that what really matters is country context and country capabilities. And also a lot of lessons to be learned from fiscal decentralization and how PFM systems have had to adapt to decentralization. Um, there's a lot to learn there in terms of facility autonomy, et cetera. Um, so now some of the more concrete areas where these two um, issues intersect and disconnect. So um, the health benefit package obviously looks at some of the reasons and why we would purchase certain services. And Amanda Glassman and colleagues a few years ago said the disconnect between aspirational health plans and actually available financial plans and other resources is the single most common failing of existing benefit plans in low-income countries. And although this is quite old, it still resonates very strongly. And the challenge doesn't stem just from the Ministry of Health and its inability to plan effectively according to a resource constraint. It's also that the, the a resource constrained HVP requires a realistic medium term forecast from the Ministry of Finance. We know that ministry, um, medium term um, expenditure frameworks haven't worked out very well in low income environments. They often prove to be a very loose and inaccurate um, forecast of expenditure over the medium term. But really, this can be as simple as a medium term fiscal framework that sets out the aggregate resources available to different spending agencies and how these will be allocated amongst them. And a first step here is for the Ministry of Finance to simply improve the reliability of macroeconomic and fiscal forecasts that underpin these, these um, frameworks, and that will boost credibility of the HVPs. And then another question becomes how to ensure prioritization decisions taken in HVP formulation actually translate into budgets. And that is a very political process. Um, Agnes may mention in terms of Nigeria, and I think it was also Burkina Faso, where additional resources have actually flown to the health sector because of a well-defined HPP, and the HPPs have been fully funded. Whereas in Malawi, the situation has been slightly difficult, where the essential health package is more of an aspirational plan that isn't necessarily resource constrained. But just very practically, um, what, again, from Amanda Glassman, the, for the HPP um, prioritization to be realized in practice, budgets have to be coded and allocated in a way that links the, links to the tracking and provision of the interventions or products included in the plan. So this is what the Ministry of Finance really needs, 
is to include it in the standard chart of accounts and have um, codes associated with each of these uh, spending items. Okay. And then there is obviously this very overwhelming and widespread belief that PFM systems are simply a constraint to provider payment reforms. And this is um, a quote from the health financing community. And it says, output-based payment is nearly impossible when budget appropriation is based on input-based line items for healthcare providers' expenditure. But this is actually a false conception. Sorry. It's actually a false conception. Budget appropriation is done at a high level. So that's either by the vote or by recurrent or capital expenditure. And that doesn't actually need to impede your choice of payment mechanism. But what may be required here is that spending controls are relaxed. And that can be done as the Ministry of Finance builds trust in line agencies and in facilities, as they can show that they're monitoring and spending well. And there's also a very strong push and contention amongst the health financing and health economics community that program-based budgeting is an essential requirement for output-based payment mechanisms. But we know that throughout the continent, these haven't worked very well. They stay as presentational program-based budgets. They may be reported against, but execution is against line items. That stays the default. And I think it, it's, to me, there's clarity that high-level line item budgets could do the job. It doesn't have to be as detailed as we see them now. Having a high-level line item budget can facilitate output-based payment mechanisms. And there's a very good reason why line item budgets have stood the test of time. And this is Aaron Waldowski um, from 1978. And he's saying that line item budgeting lasts not because it succeeds brilliantly on every criterion, so it's not a perfect system, but because it's simpler, easier, and more controllable. It's useful to a budgetary process and should put to perform tolerably well under all conditions. So, I mean, I'm not disparaging program-based budgeting. It is a very useful reform, but output-based payment mechanisms are very much possible within a line item budget system especially if your appropriation controls and your spending controls are relaxed. And that comes with building trust between the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health and Facilities. But then also, even if you do transition from line item budgeting, nothing will really change in terms of improving performance and paying on outputs if the budget remains centralized and formulated in controls at, by bureaucrats at the center and divorced from the point of delivery. So I guess instead of asking, again, I'm kind of hammering home the point, but instead of asking, do you have a line item budget or a program budget, we perhaps should be asking who is responsible for budget formulation and budget adjust adjustment. And that takes me to the next point, which is something I think will resonate with most people in this room, is in terms of provider autonomy. Um, there is a growing body of evidence showing that autonomy matters more than outputs and definitely more than, in, uh, than performance-based incentives. So, um, it, and if we say that provider and facility autonomy and, uh, and control over their finances is what really matters, then a key issue for the Ministry of Finance and PFM is aligning responsibilities for budgetary and financial management with responsibilities for management of service delivery. So I'll briefly show you an example from Uganda um, where each hospital, um, so you can mainly see referral hospitals here, but it's even lower level hospitals, ha has its own vote in the central government's budget. And amounts for lower level facilities are also clearly shown in local government budgets, and transfers are then made directly to their bank accounts for Ministry of Finance. And this doesn't require program-based budgeting, just as a side note. Um, but even in Uganda, where they have a quite a well-developed system and they have encouraged provider autonomy, financial autonomy still remains limited. They don't have full control over, um, over salaries, and there are impediments that come from the civil servants' um, regulation, and, and that may be difficult and politically difficult to change. But there's other reasons why a government may not feel necessarily very comfortable with providing full autonomy to uh, downstream. So a bit of a reality check on financial management capacity. And I think this is something for that surprises me quite often when these discussions about provider autonomy happen, 
is there isn't necessarily a reality check on the fact that most of these facilities and even hospitals don't have the capacity to manage their resources effectively. So in order for, for financial management to be guaranteed, facilities must manage funds prudently, they must report frequently and comprehensively, and use effective and due process for procuring goods and services. That's just a given. Um, but through, since the start of decentralization, what's been observed, and this was also mentioned by the Thinkwell panel, that implementing deconcentrated PFM reforms in low capacity contexts often is very difficult. The further you go get from the center, the less PFM capacity there is. And the, the reasons for that might be manifold. There's lower pay, so you have less qualified people down the line. People want to be in urban areas and in the center. So there's, there's manifold reasons. And hospitals will often have an accountant or, or maybe a bookkeeper, but facilities finance is often managed by a nurse or at best a doctor. So there isn't a dedicated financial management professional who's there, who's keeping a ledger of expenditure and revenue. And my experience is that the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, or an independent purchaser doesn't necessarily have the capacity or will to upskill these downstream actors. There's a lot of them, and bringing them all together for a three-day event may not be the most effective way of doing it. You may have to have someone going out into rural facilities and doing that training, and then you have to make sure that that person remains in place. And then this is something that's already come up and I'm excited to hear it because it's something that I want to investigate more. And I know between ODI and Thinkwell, there is forthcoming research to look at how digital technologies can support provider autonomy. And it's very much in its nascent stage, so I wouldn't be able to comment on it. But um, looking at things like how um, smart cards or mobile money that automatically capture spending categories might reduce the financial management burden on um, on the medical offices or the accountants in those facilities and hospitals. And then also I think something that hopefully Agnes will speak to is, um, is there a role for civil society in holding providers accountable? If we see that the facilities and even hospitals and government or the purchaser doesn't necessarily have that capacity, can civil society uh, step in? And we've also heard a lot today about the Kino Faso's Gratuité pro uh, Program, and there civil society has been very active in assisting with recordings. And I think, Agnes, that I read that in the paper that you wrote, so I'd be very interested to hear from you. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. That's, that's it for me. And thank you for your patience with um, the technical difficulties. But um, I'll just hand over first to Agnes to come in as a discussant. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to provide you a brief bio for Agnes. Um, she's a health economist based in Nairobi. She's an associate director at the Results for Development and a resource person at the Strategic Purchasing Africa Resource Center, SPARC, where she's facilitated work with partners across Africa who've documented purchasing arrangements in 10 African countries. She also supports the application of the cross-programmatic efficiency analysis diagnostic tool developed by the WHO and leads the health financing and sustainability portfolio on USAID funded um, act to end neglected tropical diseases. Thanks so much, Agnes. Over to you. Thank you, Danielle. And uh, she forgot to mention that I'm very good at managing roving mics as well. So <laughs> Yes, she is. I am. Thank you. No, I, I am really honored to be at this session and being a discussant um, at this session. And what I'll do is just share some reflections from work that we did on Spark Strategic Purchasing Africa Resource Center, with the um, technical partners based on the continent, and what we found as we were looking at the purchasing arrangements. And so I'll, I'll be borrowing a lot from that body of work. And just to mention, I don't see any of them here, but um, they, they worked really hard to, to bring this body of knowledge together. I also say that in the health sector, we tend to like our labels. And so I think Danielle rightly said that, you know, we talk about strategic purchasing and PFM, and there's been a bit of misnomer in thinking that strategic purchasing works only for insurance-based systems, but it's not really true because what we're talking about is how we transfer funds that have been pulled to the healthcare provider. And if you think of the government budget, they use the PFM system to do exactly that. So really it's just two sides of the same coin. And if you think of the main steps in the budgeting process, if you think of planning 
and uh, budgeting, you're talking about identifying priorities, what services are you going to use or allocate your resources to, which populations are you going to prioritize. You're also going to be thinking about where those resources are flowing, which level of providers, what type of providers. Um, and then you're going to use a mechanism to channel those funds. And I think that's where PFM becomes a big topic when we talk about allocating and, and transferring uh, pooled funds to providers in terms of um, other mechanisms able to get resources to where they're needed um, and keeping in front and center the populations that need to be served. And then there's a the whole accountability arrangements. And if you think about it, these are public funds and we must be accountable for these funds. And so even just with, um, if you think of purchasing, yes, we're transferring funds, but we must have accountability, not just for the resources themselves, but also the quality of care that's being provided. As I said, very similar concepts. And so I just wanted to make sure we have that you know, ground level understanding. Um, even as I talk about four key things that come out from, from the papers related to this subject, I'm going to try and speak to the points Danielle said um, through a storytelling kind of format for three countries. Um, I hope you haven't heard too much about Burkina Faso because it's one of my three, and then Uganda and Tanzania. And I know Tanzania has been spoken a lot about, um, so I hope my story will say something different as well. So what are my four points? Um, the first is we need to remember, just as aligned to the session title, keeping the focus on the people, keeping them front and center, <clears throat> that what we're aiming to do is to achieve UHC, so access to quality health services and removing the financial hardship. And so what are the system objectives to achieve UHC and what solutions are we putting in place to address these objectives? And are we focusing more on the solution? vis-a-vis -vis the objective of ensuring access to populations um, for priority services and looking at the principles of which populations are we focusing on. And I think that's something Anne was trying to say about Kenya's NHIF, um, that how you define the type of services and, and the population groups is very important to be able to achieve uh, growth um, equitably. Um, the second point is building on what we have. And so, you know, as much as you'll see in many African countries, this drive or interest to set up health insurance schemes, you'll find that um, other than a few exceptions, and here, you know, thinking of where um, health insurance or community-based health insurance has taken root, the government budget is actually the largest pool of health funds. And so if we ignore the government budget and the opportunities therein to improve how resources flow, then, you know, we can't really be talking about trying to achieve universal health coverage. And so I think it's also realizing the reality that public financial management um, rules are set by the Ministry of Finance and they can't keep making special arrangements for just one ministry. So I think there's someone talk about a whole of government approach. So how are we making PFM work not just for health, but also other health sectors? And then the third is, even as we talk about um, provider payment, and that's a key point um, Danielle raised, that provider autonomy is critical. And even as we give autonomy, we must consider accountability arrangements. You must account for the resources that you give and you're accountable for the resources and also the quality of care. And this morning in one of the sessions, uh, Professor Hanson said, Professor Kara Hanson said that it doesn't matter how you pay providers if they don't have the autonomy or mandate to spend the resources to address population needs. So you can talk and talk and talk about, oh, you should put in this provider payment mechanism or the other, but the reality is if you do not think of how the individual working in the health facility can then use these funds to make sure that they have the right services being delivered, that they're able to buy the commodities that are needed or the essential um, supplies that they need to deliver services, then those services will not be available at the right quality level. Um, and then the last is provider payment. Think about it as a resource allocation mechanism for the government budget and how can we do that? So I hope that in one of my case examples, I'll be able to, to provide an idea of how that works. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, I do have a cold. So those are the four key points I wanted to make and I wanted to bring them up front, even as I talk about the, the three countries. And I'll start with my neighbor, Tanzania. I am Kenyan. And um, I'll start with what were the issues in Tanzania? 
and any Tanzanians here can, can also correct me. Um, but when they did a public expenditure review, what they found is that there are actually very few resources that get to the healthcare providers, right? So as much as we have this global budget, um, what was actually getting the providers to allow them to um, manage stockouts, for example, or getting commodities or being able to do community outreaches was very minimal, which was disabling them from addressing population needs. And then where were the bottlenecks? Why weren't resources getting to the provider level? And what they found is that resources do flow, but at the district level, there is a district medical officer who makes the decisions on which um, invoices they're going to approve, which activities they're going to approve. And, and so you emasculate the, the providers. They're not able to make the decisions on what is needed. And yet they're the ones closest to the communities that they serve. And so, you know, with that problem being identified, they try to see what is the mechanism that we can use. And what's interesting about Tanzania is that um, what we had earlier today, the direct facility financing was not just for the health sector. They also introduced it for the education sector. So looking at both sectors and what could be a need they can address that would solve the issues they're seeing for both and getting resources to where they're needed. Um, and so for the health sector specifically, they started by pooling um, what they call the health basket funds and they put together on budget support from donors and they put that with a government budget. So then what you do is reduce fragmentation because what was happening is, um, you know, certain resources were fixed for certain services, right? And then at the district level, it was decided how they were going to allocate it. But by creating a clear platform, this is a health basket fund. This is how they're going to flow to the facilities. And then recognizing a facility as an individual unit, similar to what we saw for Uganda. And so they're able to receive resources directly. But also remembering that there are, in any status quo, they're losers that you have to manage and interests. So what do you do to the district that is being, um, is that resources, a big pool of resources is being taken away from them and being taken to the facilities. So what they did is um, at the district level, they also um, gave them a role in the planning and budgeting process of approving and even when um, incurring expenditure, you know, you must have some sign off, but it doesn't hold back the facility from actually, you know, planning or um, allocating resources. And I know we talked about the CSOs, but in Tanzania, what they did is that they brought communities through health facility governance committees, and they set up these committees as a check from the perspective of the beneficiaries to be able to approve the plans and budgets, to be able to approve spending. And they also look at the reports from the health facility managers. So that was an accountability mechanism that they used, not just at the district level, but also going down to the community level. And what this has done is, of course, there are very many fears that if you take funding down, you'll never know what happens. And so um, again, I'd, I'd be happy to hear from Tanzanians, but the analysis so far is that they have not seen as much misappropriation as they had assumed. And actually most of the facilities are compliant in sending a planning place in time, um, using uh, the automated process for setting plans and budgets, and they are using resources as per their plans and budgets. And for them as a, as a provider, they have this pool of resources, whether it's a health basket fund, whether it's an NHIF, NSSF, it's one pool that they use to then decide how they're going to allocate. So giving them the power to be able to make those decisions at their level. I have a feeling I've spent a lot of time on Tanzania, and so I don't think I'll go through all of them, but I felt like Jean-Marie spent quite a bit of time on Burkina Faso, but I will talk about Uganda, and particularly linking resources to your benefit package. And I know a bit was said about program-based budgeting, and you know it's been a mixed bag in Africa, but I think um, there are some elements of it that have been positive in linking to specific priorities that are set by government and then to the sector itself and making sure that um, as you set the programs, they're linked to your essential package of services. And so um, even though you might criticize and say that under the programs, the line items are still the same and they still have the same level of rigidity, at least we're beginning to make that link between these are the resources and these are the objectives that we're trying to meet and then monitoring against the achievement of those specific health system objectives. 
And I think it's it's a first step. Um, we shall see how, how that unfolds. But I just want to leave and say that um, we cannot talk about purchasing within a vacuum. You have to think of resourcing adequately. You have to think of pooling risks, right? And then once you pull those resources, making sure that they get to the point of service delivery that actually meets the population needs. And I will stop there and happy to take any questions that might come up. Thanks so much, Agnes, that was great. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Takondwa Masa now. And Dr. Takondwa is a senior health economist with over 30 years of national and international experience in health economics, health financing reforms, health systems and service development strengthening, and health services and systems research. Um, he's currently working as a senior health economist with Arden EPAD, and he's had extensive experience before that with Abt um, Associates. Um, he led health financing and health accounts with WHO, Regional Office for Africa. Um, and Dr. Masse also holds a PhD in health economics with Magna Cum Laude from the University of Heidelberg in Germany a Master of Social Sciences um, in Health Economics from the University of Cape Town, and a Bachelor of Social Science and Economics um, from the University of Malawi. So thank you so much, Dr. De Kondwa, um, over here. Thank you very much. Mine is just a simple task this afternoon, just to look at the two presentations and maybe take some key issues which I'm hearing from them. Yeah. One issue which we have been working on for the past years with colleagues, and we had a program at one point known as Tanzir Awansa Hefe of All, where we have people like Tom Hart from ODI, we have uh, Paul Levo from University of York, and all colleagues in Malawi, the, and the EXA, Mr. Kataika, Edward Kataika, who is also here. We have really been doing a lot of work around this area of PFM, how we can improve SHC delivery, direct financing. So all that, really there's a draft paper we're trying to look at. How can these things be really, what is the experience coming out? So one of the papers which have already been published, which at least my colleague talked to about, is the issue we are getting is that the evidence of priority setting versus budgeting. What is that? There are, what is coming out is that one key issue is difficulties in making, in linking essential health packages to the budget. Budget, essential health packages, basic packages have been defined. You can look back from 1993 during the World Health, is it World Development Report, investing in health by the World Bank at that time. Since then, a lot of effort has gone in in defining these packages. But one thing that has been missing, which now as we go forward as researchers, implementers, we need to focus on is how can we make the best out of it. Malawi provides a good example. It defined a very first package around 2004, revised it in 2011, then revised it again in 2017. After revisions, what remains? When you look at the prioritize, prioritized interventions vis-a-vis -vis now the structure of the budget, you find that there is a disconnect, a huge disconnect. The budget is talking about personal emoluments. The budget is talking about drugs and medical supplies, of course, somewhere there. The budget is talking about utilities. So we have had to say, how now does this link to the outputs. So this is one of the major takeaways to say, much as we would like to improve the efficiency in resource allocation, let's focus our action on this. The other area is this, what does it imply? The implications are that maybe we need pay for performance. Maybe we need a system that uses pay for service. Maybe we need a system that used case-based payment system to change so that we are able to do, yes, we have tried program-based budgeting, but we can see there's inside program-based budgeting, there is also input-based budgeting. Okay, but what exactly, what is coming out from the ground? Again, Malawi tried to say, okay, we have to at least contract the, the faith-based facilities and pay them. So they 
experimented with payment using fee for service. But there's a challenge. If your payment mechanism is also not very much linked to the budgeting process, while the budget and the funds disbursement was just based on the, like uh, the, the input base, but they were paying these ones fee for service. As a result, they were draining more resources because these systems were not talking to each other. And there was a lot of what we can call, in quotes, gaming, where there was a prem game and the funds ran out. So all this has been evidence and has been what published. Mr. Mantar, Dr. Mantar has published a lot about this to say, here is, yes, it improved service delivery, but we encountered these problems, which even led to some discontinuation of some service level agreement. So these are the areas as we try to improve equity, as we try to improve efficiency within using the public financial management, we have also to be careful. Then there's the issue, what I call provider autonomy versus flexibility or these rigidities we are blaming the PFM system. At one point, I'm glad Daniel raised it. The line items, why were they put there? The experience that is coming from the, from the ground is that in some performance-based financing pilots, which have been piloted in our continent, there is evidence that if you don't give proper guidelines to health workers as to how to use the funds, all of the funds will go to personal incentives. That has come through because people were just told, oh, this, get this money. That money, instead of buying the essentials to provide the services, it, it ended up all paying themselves. Then we have also evidence that when we have a system where we give autonomy to some facilities, especially at the district level, they also almost do worse things than that. They can cry to say, let's have the district budget decentralized to us, that yes, it will come. Let's have the drug budget decentralized to us, it will come. But the evidence coming out is that they can even charge things which are not supposed to be charged to the drug budget as a result affecting quality of care. So these systems require what my colleagues have also touched upon, the issue of accountability. The issue of integrity, which I'm calling as my fifth point, which I am passionate about is that we have a huge no-do gap. Like clinicians, we in this sector, they, the health economist, the economist, uh, whichever other field, we have become now that we know what is supposed to be done, but we are not doing it. A good example is people will blame the PFM, the public financial management. Ah, no, the, prep, the, the PFM is not okay, it's weak. But if the experience we have now is across the region, you'll find a very good PFM document, meaning in terms of capacity, if we define capacity in the three ways of uh, policy availability of say, poly enhancing environment, which is more of policy, the acts, they are there. The PFM Act clearly spells what is supposed to be done or not done. Then we have the tools. Now we have even integrated financial management systems which are automated, they are there. Then we have the skills. We have people trained, SCCA, master's degrees in financing, in what? But what do we find? The same problems that are incurred at the lower level, where we have just a crack, are the same problems that are incurred at the headquarters of a Minister of Health in financial management, leading to continued waste. We know what is supposed to be done, but when are we going to stop? Do we need other fields to come in? Psychology, behavioral economics? Thank you. Thanks so much, Agnes and Takondwa. Um, I think both really insightful points. 
Um, I know we're running late, so Alex, I'm going to hand straight back to you. That's no, right. no, no. I think oh, we're not? so. What we're going to do is we're going to open for the questions to the the panel, okay. but also, you know, unfortunately, there's been so much discussion that we run right through the coffee break. So if you do want coffee, it's outside. Uh, quickly, you know, get it, come back in. You won't want to miss what's coming afterwards. So you know, really, uh, be as quick as you can. But thank you, uh, and carry on with the the questions. We've got the roving mics as well. Um, thanks, Danielle, and thanks to, to the panel. Uh, Jonathan Gunthorpe, SRHR Africa Trust. I'm in an NGO. Um, I'm very excited by, by all of the stuff that I heard because I, I sit on a global task team for social contracting. And in two or three global meetings we've had, I haven't heard the word strategic purchasing. But then I get nervous because today when I heard it a lot, I haven't heard the, word social con the term social contracting. So I wonder if in any of the case studies or any of the work that's happening, there is consideration of civil society, the community, NGOs as a, as a delivery platform and in social contracting, is it, part of, is it seen as part of strategic purchasing by everyone? And then also community-led monitoring. When people were talking about, Danielle, you raised it as a question, what is the role of civil society? Are there good examples of community-led monitoring, not just in delivery, but in fact in health finances? and accountability for that, particularly decentralization. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot. I'm Stephanie Hyung from the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Malawi. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first, it's really great to talk about the different language between the strategic purchasing community and the PFM community. And I think in practice as well, so in Malawi at least, if we're trying to implement a health benefits package and an input-based system, in addition to those two communities, there also is in practice thinking about how the benefits package translates into the essential medicines list, translates into the standard equipment list, translates into clinical guidelines, minimum clinical standards, the health workforce staffing norms, and so on and so forth. Um, and in practice, you know, all those different communities, many of them are not familiar with what a benefits package is, what strategic purchasing is. Um, you know, for a clinician, this can really just be alien language. And so it'd be helpful to get any reflections, you know, given those are in an input-based system in practice, how you take a benefits package and reflect it into input-based line items any reflections on how to communicate with, with those communities, um, given they're really not you know, financing experts. Um, and the second question is, um, it would be really helpful to hear, you know, in Malawi, we really are just input-based line items at the moment. Um, what do you see as the incremental next step to move towards more strategic purchasing? So if there's like a maturity model, like what is step zero step one, you know, to gradually get yourself to um, a more strategic purchasing arrangement. Um, so thank you very much to the, thank you very much to the, to the presenters. And um, it's actually quite um, exciting to hear about um, some of these, um, some of these things. Um, so, my question is um, regarding the other kinds of programs that are in the health sector. For example, um, the HIV program and the TB program. Um, most often, um, these programs um, sort of stand um, parallel and are usually um, donor driven uh, in most uh, in most cases. And uh, and the level of fragmentation in this program, with even the financing and the implementation is at the high level, but also at a um, facility level. And I'm a bit worried that uh, with the way these programs operate um, within countries, it's easy to sort of um, forget them um, in terms of uh, when we're designing benefit packages and so on and so forth. And I just want to hear from the, from the panelists, um, what are some of those deliberate efforts that have been made um, within countries um, to ensure that we don't leave out um, some of these programs like HIV program and TB program. And um, in your experience, what extent of coverage um, for these services 
have we been able to put into um, benefit package in the countries that you work in? Thanks so much. So um, I'm going to cop out and hand the first one at least to Agnes. And that was from Jonathan, who was from the Global Task Team for Social Contracting. And he was asking where social contracting fits into this, given that we didn't mention it, and the role of community-led monitoring and civil society involvement. Um, and then to Kondwa, I'm going to hand over to you, um, given you are an expert on Malawi, to uh, respond to the question from Chai um, and how the H3P translates to into essential med me um, medicines list, clinical guidelines, um, and that there is this lack of familiarity amongst health practitioners about what an HVP even is, um, and how to translate this into the budget. And then the second question I understood was, what are some of the incremental steps from that can go from line item budgeting to strategic purchasing? I think we have tried to show that you can do strategic purchasing even with a line item budget. Um, but yeah, what, what would be the next steps from Malawi and its progression to strategic purchasing? Um, and then I think we can decide on the um, the third one in terms of vertical programs like HIV and TB being incorporated into HPPs and not being forgotten. So Agnes, over to you. All right, thanks for those questions. <clears throat> so I'll start with social contracting. I actually know it as social franchising. So how you um, engage groups of private, sometimes not for profit or for profit health facilities and what mechanisms exist. Um, and I will say that um, one, one of the key questions we think about in purchasing is, of course, what you're paying for, so the benefit packages, but then where you're also buying those services from. And that's where the element of contracting happens. Um, in insurance mechanisms, those are usually pretty well defined. So they are explicit contracts that have the terms and conditions um, for service delivery. And we are seeing um, a lot of that contracting happening with the public sector, but also with the private sector, and particularly for private sector, clear rules when for accreditation um, of providers. Um, here, I will think of uh, Kenya, for example, where I come from, and my, our NHIF has its issues, but one of the things it's beginning to do is looking for those um, aggregate organizations. So for example, PSI, um, MSI have, um, networks of providers across the country in the hundreds. And rather than contracting with each individual provider, they contract with the, um, with the network operator at PSI and MSI. And then they use that to then translate um, the, the same <clears throat> expectations across the whole network. So yes, there are um, examples of those and, and beginning to, I think we're beginning to see more of them um, in Ghana, for example, the NHIA has um, a way that they contract, for example, with the FBOs through the CHAG, Prison Health Association um, of Ghana, and then they also contract with private sector providers through the aggregator as well. So I think those platforms are useful because it reduces, it reduces the administration costs of, of contracting. Um, I guess the question is, does contracting also exist with uh, the government budget? And the way um, I understand it is that what you're trying to do with the contract is to set expectations of the provider. And there are many tools that are used um, in government systems for setting expectations, such as norms and standards, right? Um, regulatory uh, standards for registration and licensing. Um, they might also have um, service guidelines, quality guidelines, quality frameworks. So there are many ways they set expectations, not necessarily having this formal contracting, but still setting those expectations clearly. So I'd say that, yes, they, they do exist and have been used in, in different forms. Um, on the community monitoring, I did speak about the health facility governance committees in Tanzania, which includes community representatives, and they use that um, mechanism to be able to engage with the facility and, you know, engage in planning and budgeting. But in terms of CSO involvement, um, I'll say that um, many countries do have the provision of having public participation in the budgeting and planning process, and they will do this um, at the national level and also at sub-national level. 
So of course, I'll go back to my home country where, and I know this also exists in Uganda, platforms for CSOs to come in and help define what are the priorities, um, and then also providing the check and balance. So when government accounts are released and you know audits of the government agencies at national level and county level, CSOs being used, using that to advocate and, and bring up into the national dialogue on what can be done to make this better. So I'd say, yes, there are opportunities to do that. Just spoken to a few in a very long-winded way, and I do apologize. Um, the other question, can I go to the next question? Or? Um, yeah, okay, all right. Um, the other was on the incremental step for line item budgeting for more strategic purchasing. And I like what Danielle said. It doesn't mean that you can't be a better purchaser with a line item budget. And for me, it's more about you, you can pay by capitation, you can pay the global budget, you can pay by line item, but if the provider is not able to use those resources, it doesn't matter how you pay. And I think that's what we need to focus more on, that whatever resources trickle down, let's try and get more resources actually trickling down to the points where they're needed, and then giving the providers the autonomy to make decisions with accountability for making those decisions. I liked the Tanzania case because they did not have that decision space, and now they do. Um, and they are using capitation. So they changed the allocation formula to capitation, so per head. And then they added some adjusters, for example, remoteness, disease burden, so that uh, if it's you know higher disease burden um, and or you're more remote, you do get a bit more. So I think there are certain steps you can take. I think it's it must be context specific. So you know what might work in Tanzania might not necessarily work for Malawi. But if you can start with first making sure even the little they receive the line item they can use, and then that makes a case for okay that wasn't sufficient. Now we need to think of how we can um, move. Um, and um, to something more output based or even adding more flexibility in line items. So for example, there are fixed line items, could there be 10% budget flexibility? And what does that do for the provider? So I think it's testing, improving as, and iterating as you go along. Right. Uh, there was the other program then, was that mine? Um, so I think Cassandra might want to comment okay. on um, I don't know how much time we have left. Yeah. Oh. On on the the issue of uh, essential packet, or and you've said that maybe that would be given and Ah, okay. No, the, the major issue we have here is like this: when we were like when we are doing this essential benefit package, the prioritization. When you look at the list of interventions that have been chosen, you find that when it comes to curative or those services which are specific. It's mainly already the drugs and medical supplies risk that is used to, to be costed for that essential package to say, these are the priorities you've chosen based on burden of disease, cost-effective intervention. Most of those interventions are the drugs and medical supplies that goes with it, following the standard practice. So it is like most of the things have already been done. If I recall for your case in Malawi, you find that in 2003, four, before, it, when it was just defined, the package, there was a lot of work to do with the essential drug list. There was also a lot of work to do with the treatment guidelines. So all of that was done and you prepare it to say, what would it need now to be delivered at the facility level? But one thing that was missed at that time, of course, there was a, a, like human resource, what, what requirements at each level, community, a secondary tertiary going up. But for the interventions, the model itself that was being used, the epidemiological model, was very clear to say how many people will enter this, where will this intervention be delivered? Is it at community? Is it at health center? Is it at secondary? Is it at tertiary? So all numbers, according to burden of disease, were expected. So they were linked to the unit of, of what? The cost of that what? Person. So it is like if you have malaria, you, it is well linked. So the idea at that time was like the way we have been saying that an insurance package, let's take it for insurance. How do they pay? If they choose, they will use the fee for service. Why do they do that? Because they know what it costs to provide that care. So even if we had costed for each item, in most packages I've seen around the, the continent, you'll find that now, when it comes to payment, it is not paid like that. 
it is paid using another mechanism, which now incrementally, as my colleague is saying, the proposal from Malawi is maybe to move to say, look, or even other country, at primary level, how should we pay providers? The starting point, we can say capitation, because we we'll know that this is the package and how much it will cost, so we will negotiate with the provider to say, look, this is what we have. At what level, if we say secondary, this is what we think we can pay reasonably. Whether it is a, we use case based, that will be the beginning of now being realistic. And that will even make sure that most of our countries, instead of just in free care for everyone, will be now thinking to say, we can't afford to do everything. In the absence of that, we are doing the implicit rationing, which is also killing people innocently because we don't have the drugs, we don't have this, but we are saying free health for everyone. Thanks so much for that. So I think the question on um, vertical programs, incorporating that into the HIV, that will probably come up later in the donor uh, funding session. I think it is a very important question, and in terms of the transition, how are those costed and brought into that? Um, thank you so much, and sorry for going a bit over time, and no. thank you for... Just thank you to Danielle and the panel once again. Um, so excellent so uh, we're going to move on swiftly uh, we've heard a lot about national health financing dialogues um so far but first-hand experience from uh the legend that's been organizing one of them uh is is what we'll hear from next we've got um regina Ombam, uh who will take us through a presentation on the kenya national health financing dialogue um, you know, we hear a lot about the political economy, about the importance of getting the right people in the room. Um, but until you are actually, you know, someone with so many years experience in such, uh, you know, with uh, working at, as uh, she has 20 years over over 20 years experience as a health economics advisor to the Council of Governors, County Director of the Health Policy Plus, a Deputy Director of the National AIDS uh, Commission, a lecturer. Uh, at the University of Nairobi, senior economist in, in the Anti-Corruption Commission in Kenya. She's also, I mean, one of the things for, for the Global Fund, one of probably the most important people outside of the Global Fund as the vice chair of the technical review panel. So if ever you've been involved in writing grants to the Global Fund, they probably pass through Kenya's, uh, through, through Regina's hands. So I will pass you on uh, swiftly now um, to Reg Regina. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and uh, good evening, everyone, uh, for the very great introduction. So with all that, I think for today, I'm sitting, I'm standing here as the East Africa Community Facilitator on Health Financing Dialogues. And the first dialogue that we did uh, for this process is in Kenya. We have Burundi and Rwanda that is coming in September but I'll just walk you through what happened in the Kenyan space. So in terms of a background, this whole process started from uh, after the 32nd uh, extraordinary meeting for the heads of states and government at the African Union. And in February, 2019, when the heads of states actually realized it is really important to invest domestically in health in the region. This was coming as a result of even the heads of states realizing that financing for health was dwindling, uh, COVID was coming into play, and all these things really needed the countries to start thinking domestically. So they needed to strengthen their domestic resource mobilization mechanisms. And in that case, therefore, uh, the East Africa community and SADC were among the regional uh, bodies that were tasked with overseeing the implementation of the 10 commitments that were agreed upon by the heads of state in 2019. So for the East African community, we, uh, we are piloting in three countries, Kenya, Burundi, and uh, Rwanda. And we expect that the outcomes of these dialogues will actually inform the sectoral council meeting that is to be held in October of 2023 uh, for the East Africa community. So this uh, dialogue for Kenya in particular was defined and discussed in line with four key objectives. 
The first one was that Kenya was actually going to look at what was coming out from the health financing scooping report and actually review those issues that were coming from there to be able to help guide the next uh, mechanism of financing for health in the Kenyan space. The second thing was uh, Kenya was going to look at its health financing strategy and actually see which strategies are working, which ones are not and why, so that they can actually make some informed decisions around what to go forward with. The third objective was that Kenya committed to actually implementing those 10 uh, declarations. So they had to see what they were going to do in terms of actions, timelines, and also responsibilities. So the dialogue process in Kenya was uh, designed in three phases. The first phase was what we call the pre-dialogue process, where uh, we model it around the philosophy of uh, uh, Kenyan's government, we call it the bottom-up approach, where we start with the stakeholders, engage the stakeholders in discussions around what this means, what are the issues, and then get the stakeholders present their respective position papers around that. Now, this process was very intense in itself. It actually took around four months of intensive discussions with specific stakeholders in their respective constituencies so that they are able now to start understanding why are we going for a high level dialogue? What do we need to bring to that dialogue? So what we did in Kenya is we met with the Ministry of Health, explained to them the purpose of the dialogue, that is the leadership of the Ministry of Health, and asked the Ministry of Health to take leadership in that process we also met with the Ministry of Finance, explained the same to the Ministry of Finance. We had meetings with the civil society organization, meetings with the Council of Governors. You know Kenya is a devolved government in itself. We had meetings with the private sector, and we also even had meetings with development partners and also meetings with the media. Why am I expressing this? This is so important for us to understand that you cannot just go into a country and say you want to do a high level dialogue. You must first involve the different stakeholders so that they actually buy in to the concept, then it becomes easier for you to actually move with it going forward. So in that first phase, we, we discussed uh, the issues around what this requires. We set up a multi-stakeholder steering committee which was actually led by the Ministry of Health. So it was actually the Ministry of Health writing to the other ministries to, to send nominees to sit into the steering committee to actually plan for this high level dialogue. So that multi-sectoral meeting comprised of representatives from other ministries, that is the Ministry of East Africa Community, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Labor, all those key ministries that we felt had a stake in the health sector space were actually in that steering committee. Their role was actually to steer that planning for the dialogue. At the same time, as I indicated, we had consultations with the different uh, stakeholders. And in those consultations, the stakeholders came up with position papers, which I have copies and I, I'm sure you will get to see. And in the analysis, we actually situated them based on those four benchmarks that are in the, in the scorecard, in the tracker, that is the more money for health, the more health for the money, equity in health financing and utilization, and leadership and governance. So these are some of the position papers that were, came out from the pre-dialogue stage. And we organized the dialogue in such a way that from these position papers, the information that was coming from these position papers was actually going to be used to develop technical papers as well as the country position paper that was actually going to be read as a statement by the head of state during the high level dialogue. So the people who are asking questions around the political economy, we actually used that uh, concept by understanding that 
Issues can be technical in nature, but the final decision is a political decision. So how do you translate all this technical information that you have into a political decision making that can be implemented? So we have copies of these position papers here with us, so you can actually get copies uh, for your own use. What we did during uh, the pre-dialogue phase, we had actually planned to have a media briefing uh, as a capacity building session for the media on, on, on high level dialogue. When we planned for that conference for the media, it was actually the media group that told us it is really not necessary for you to organize for a capacity building workshop for the media. Arrange for a media briefing just before the high level meeting so that the media can be able to capture the information that is needed. And when the dialogue happens, they can be able to communicate and report right after the dialogue. So I thought this is something also to share that uh, we had a session for the media just before the dialogue. Remember, we did the, the high level dialogue on the last week of June. So mid June is when we had the media briefing where we called the media to a breakfast meeting and briefed them on the intention of the dialogue, the commitments, the reason behind and the expectations. So they had all this information a priori. So on the day of the dialogue, they were then able to understand what they are expected to report. And I must confess that for the first time in country, we had extensive media coverage that was really positive on a health uh, uh, on a health dialogue or a health meeting. Then the phase two. So we finished the pre-dialogue. We did all that, and and then we come to the main uh, dialogue event. And this is where we, because we had captured it as a high-level dialogue, we actually decided that this dialogue has to be presided over by the head of state. Now for a head of state meeting, there's a lot that goes on in the background. But even as we were doing the pre-dialogue, we were already engaging with the ministry to think about what the high level dialogue will entail. In that process, at first we actually told that you have to do a cabinet memo, then take it to the cabinet for the cabinet to make a decision on whether the president should be attending your meeting or not. So we did the cabinet memo and uh, took it to the cabinet secretary. That same week after I had already made contact with the principal secretary who was there for health, the following week there were transfers. So he was taken out and uh, I had to actually think, you know, what should I do? I've already made very good inroads. But for my last briefing, I actually stressed to the principal secretary, for whoever is coming in to take your position, please tell him this is high priority. This dialogue that is forthcoming is high priority and therefore he needs to give me an audience. And that is exactly what happened. When the new principal secretary came in, he actually advised me against the whole issue of cabinet memo. He said, you want the president to come in as your chief guest. All you need to do is write to the head of the public service requesting for the president to come in as a chief guest. Then the head of the public service will ensure that that is put in the diary and they block it. Why am I giving you this information? I'm giving you this information for you to understand the complexities that happen within a system. You get one information on something, you get another information on something else, and you can actually feel like you want to despair, but if you really want to go, you go ahead and say, okay, this is what you want, I'll do the letter. So we did that and we were able to get uh, everything into the diary. Now our organ, our plan for the dialogue was such that on the third day of the dialogue is when the president would come in and uh, out of the discussions of everything that had happened in the first and the second day, then he would present the position paper. But when we went to brief the people organizing, they said there's no way the president can come the, the last day. The president will come on the first day as a chief guest and give his uh, remarks on the first day. So we had to make a choice. You want high level? you better go with what they decide. So we said, it's okay, let him come on the first day 
and have him make the presentation, but we will still do the country position paper on, on, on the third day. So that is how the meetings were organized. On the first day, it was more of a political process where uh, we waited for the president and uh, he, he never showed up. I sent the prime cabinet secretary, but everything was actually in place for a presidential function, including even the program. So he sent the prime uh, uh, cabinet secretary uh, which is actually another high office in, in, in command. And uh, the meeting went very well with uh, the president giving his uh, uh, commitment. This was a meeting that invited even delegates from uh, outside uh, Kenya. So it was really high level. And uh, from that day on, I must report here that uh, the next two countries, Rwanda and Burundi, have had sleepless nights because they were present in this dialogue and they're really pushing to make sure they too have a high level dialogue. So the contagion effect is actually working very well. Interestingly, in the Kenyan uh, dialogue, when we put the stakeholder meetings on that day, it was divided based on the benchmarks. So the groupings were not in terms of civil society going to room A, government going to room B. We divided the groups in terms of the benchmarks that are in the school card and the tracker. So there was a group for more money for health, a group for more health for the money, a group for governance and the leadership, and a group on equity and financial protection. In each of these groups, there was representation from all the stakeholder groups. So there was government, civil society, development partners, uh, parliament, media, academia. And so they had very rich discussions. We felt this is the only way in which you can actually have impactful discussions coming from the different constituencies in a topical area, rather than having a group discussing their issues. So, from it, like the group that was discussing more money for health, they were, they, the main focus was on when we talk about more, what do we mean by more? Do we really understand where we are coming from in terms of the metrics of the baseline so that when we now go to ask for more, we know what we are asking for? And so those discussions in that group were actually capitalizing on really understanding the data around raising, allocating, and spending of resources. The next group on the more health for the money was more on the issues of efficiency, effectiveness, and prioritization. Those were really key areas that came in in discussions. The third on leadership and governance actually focused more on leadership in the area of health financing. How is that managed? How is that coordinated? and how are uh, alignments happening from the different uh, uh, partners that we have. Then on equity, uh, the whole issue around equity in resource mobilization and utilization. And there was a lot of extensive discussion on financial protection and the real definition around equity. I think there was really good discussion around really distinguishing the difference between equity and equality in that group. So that is what happened. So this are just slides to show the kind of coverage that we got from the media. And upon completion, we are now on the post dialogue phase. We are uh, stipulating that now that happens between July and early next year, so that we are able to continue this dialogue. So what we are saying is the dialogue is not a one-off event. It is something that needs to continue year in, year out. But as I speak now already, the team is working on finalizing on the, on the dialogue meeting report. So on the week of 17th, they will be having a retreat to finalize on that document. And then the steering committee now will actually start looking at the implementation because there was a country position paper that was read out to the audience on what they want to do going forward so that they meet those ALM commitments. And then also there was a lot of discussion around the hub that is proposed, 
the country feels there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of really understanding that operationalization of that hub going forward. And then the country strongly feels it is important that the head of state is really well informed prior to the next AU meeting so that when they report on Kenya, they're actually reporting on something that is evidenced informed and is well articulated and understood by the country in totality. This is what I have to report on, on, on the Kenyan dialogue. It is an intensive process, very resource heavy, requires concerted efforts, and therefore, if it is something that we feel is good for the continent, let us also just sit back and ask ourselves, how much are we bringing into that process going forward so that we actually make these dialogues robust and impactful? Because that is actually the reason why we are saying as technical people, we are the ones to implement those policy, political decisions that have been made by our political leaders. So in terms of implementation, how much resource are we willing to put in so that we implement effectively? Thank you very much. View of the, of the Kenya National Health Financing Dialogue. And for those eager live, when uh, Regina talked about it being the 26th and 28th of June, that's right, that was last week. So uh, coming straight, uh, straight from the national dialogue into this, so there's no rest for the, for the wicked, <laughs> right? Um, I know there's going to be a lot of questions for Regina, um, and, and unfortunately we have to move on for the, for the, the, final, the final panel. Um, discussion, but Regina is going to be around, uh, you know, tonight, tomorrow. I, I'm sure you could take her out for dinner. Uh, <laughs> so I do encourage you to engage in, engage over the breaks. Um, I want to now just uh, really kick us off to the last section um, of of this this event, and it's really a lot more focused on bringing in the ministries of finance into the whole in the whole, whole health financing uh, discourse, as, as Regina said you know, bringing the right stakeholders to have that discussion is, is, is absolutely critical. Um, and so uh, we are going to be, be addressing this thing of, of, of how uh, can ministries of finance support uh, ministries of health on domestic spending for health, but then also asking the questions on what can development partners do to be better partners to ministries of finance when engaging on and supporting health financing reforms. Those are the kind of two uh, main questions we have for, for the last part. So to kick us off um, for the final part, we actually have a, um, a presentation by ODI, um, who will be talking about uh, ministries of finance, uh, what, what ministries of finance can do to support health spending. Um, and then follow that quickly, we'll have a uh, presentation by um, Natilla from our health financing department on just some of the work that the Global Fund uh, is doing to support health financing reforms. Then, uh, so that's the, the kind of first, first part. We'll then move into a panel discussion, as I mentioned, um, which will be facilitated and moder moderated by, uh, by Regina. Um, and, and we'll introduce those people uh, as, as we go. So first of all, I'd like to present um, Tom Hart uh, from ODI to kick us off for this discussion. Tom is a senior research fellow. His work under, is, seeks to understand how public PFM can support improved delivery of public service and covers budget reform, fiscal de decentralization, health financing, and, and public investment manager, uh, management. He's worked in Kenya, Malawi, Nepal, Somaliland, South Sudan, and Uganda. Um, before joining ODI, Tom lived and worked for seven years in South Sudan and Uganda. So um, I'll invite Tom uh, first to the stage just to, just to present um, from ODI. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I feel rather self-conscious when I know Mark Bletcher from the South African Treasury, who um, like actually actually has to kind of walk the walk of um, being in a finance ministry and supporting um, uh, health spending is going to be on the panel. So um, these these are kind of my thoughts. I hope that I hope that Mark will concur with them um, rather than rather than coming on and saying that I've got completely the wrong end of wrong end of the stick with this. Um, 
so th this comes from, you know, why are we even talking about this? Um, we're talking about, it comes from the global funds interest in supporting ministries of finance. But I think the prior question is, what, um, what, what are we expecting ministries of finance to do on health spending and on health financing? So I think the prior question is, what can ministries of finance do to, to, to support more effective health spending? And then we've, once we've answered that question, we can think about what is the role of development partners in supporting ministries of finance to undertake those functions. So here are 10 things that I think a Ministry of Finance um, can do to, um, to support more effective health financing. Um, so, so the first one is improving medium term resource forecasting to enable resource constraint planning and priority setting. We heard um, in, in the kind of previous conversation about a major problem with health benefits packages being that they are not resource constrained, so they are not effective prioritization vehicles. So the first thing that a Ministry of Finance needs to do is to provide a realistic medium term forecast that can allow ministers of health and other agencies in government um, to uh, to plan for the medium term more effectively. Um, so, you know, th this a lot of this will get into discussions about medium term expenditure frameworks and so on. And I think, you know, this needs to be as simple as setting out the aggregate resources that are likely to be available on current policy for um, departments. So the first step here is improving the reliability of um, macroeconomic and fiscal forecasts. And so before I started, I should have said the one thing I've not put on here is give the health sector more money. Because I'm talking about all the other things that can be done aside from giving more money in a situation where many countries across the world, but especially in the global south and in Africa, have extremely tight fiscal positions, have an incredible amount of competing priorities um, with the having to recover from COVID, with having to respond to food price spikes, with having to promote economic growth through investments in education and infrastructure and so on. So I don't think there can be any confidence that health is necessarily going to win out on those arguments. So there may be more money available, but there's lots of other things to be done as well as that. So the, the second thing is enabling both a bottom-up budget process that enables ministers of health to present where they think they can reallocate funds, but also a challenge function from the Ministry of Finance to challenge the quality of um, sector budgets. So an entirely top-down budget process of setting ministry budget ceilings will undermine allocative efficiency because we need to be able to allow some bottom-up um, spending proposals as an input for central decision makers so they can see which sectors are coming up with you know better ideas um, for for how they can spend money ideas which are more aligned with national strategies and so on so and line ministries ideally need to be given some flexibility to prioritize and reprioritize their expenditure within an overall resource constraint um, but that degree of flexibility is going to come down to what is ultimately an issue of trust and an issue of whether the Ministry of Finance believes and trusts that line ministries can make difficult trade-offs, can reallocate based on evidence of effectiveness, and can accurately cost new initiatives. Because if a Ministry of Finance doesn't trust that a ministry will take difficult decisions, if all they think is they're just always going to be asking for more money without examining what they're already spending on, if they don't trust that any new initiatives are going to be accurately costed, they're always going to be turned down because the belief will be, well, you've told us it'll cost this much. You start implementing and come back to us and say, actually, you know, if you want us to do this, we need twice as much money as you said in the first place. Um, and so this bottom-up budgeting also needs greater scrutiny from the centre. So there's the incentive effect that, you know, if a Ministry of Health knows that its budget proposals are going to get properly scrutinized by the Ministry of Finance, then hopefully that will help increase their, pro their, their quality. But that also requires the capacity to do that to be built within the Ministry of Finance. So typically a Ministry of Finance will have a set of desk officers who are responsible for looking at sector budgets. In many finance ministries, their functions at the moment are essentially administrative. They're responsible for um, the environments for um, authorizing release of funds, but that role has to change and they need to become uh, more like policy experts um, in, oh, sorry, okay. um, they, they need to be more like policy experts in that sector. And that also 
requires to thinking about what the staffing models are, how long rotations are between different positions and so on. Um, the third one, sorry, and Alex told me to keep to five minutes, which I've not, not done. This was meant to be 10 minutes originally. Um, so I'm gonna whiz through. The third one is uh, spending reviews to identify waste and areas of less effectiveness. Briefly, this is not about kind of externally financed public expenditure reviews. This is about ministries of finance and line ministries working jointly together to identify areas where savings could be made, um, either to increase efficiency or to, to support reallocations to more uh, high priority areas. Um, the fourth area is uh, increasing budget credibility through enhanced cash management to make sure that ministries of health actually get the funds that have been promised to them in the budget. Um, and that, that requires both um, the Ministry of Health being able to forecast its cash needs better and the Ministry of Finance being able to forecast the aggregate cash that it's going to have available for spending. Um, a fifth area is adjusting spending controls to increase line ministry flexibility. So often um, countries will run very strict controls on line items, even below the appropriated level. So parliaments will typically pass a um, amount for each ministry that will be split into either salaries operating in capital or maybe into recurrent and development. And below that, there will be a set of rules about what allocations are allowed below, below that. And depending on the line item structure can be set up as very detailed items or as broader categories. And so there are ways to think about how, um, how different uh, combinations of spending controls can, can allow some degree of flexibility for line ministries without increasing fiduciary risks. Um, so those, those are all things which are kind of broadly on the standard kind of budget um, preparation, budget execution cycle. The second side of things are more things about how the um, public financial management um, and um, on the last item tax policy kind of uh, processes and systems are structured. So um, we've talked about facilitating service provider autonomy and how essential that is. You know, ultimately that's something that has to be done in partnership between the Ministry of Finance and, and the um, line ministry, whether it's, and, and potentially also with re, um, ministries of local government or, or, or um, for responsible for subnational government, whether that's kind of the financial management capacity building, putting new systems in place that go down to the facility level and so on. Um, a seventh area is supporting the capacity of that finance function in um, the line ministry. And I think, you know, especially we're here at a global fund event and we had the question raised earlier about how the vertical funds sit in. If um, most donors in the health sector are, uh, or most development partners in the health sector are primarily concerned with vertical funds and they are engaging and building the capacity of the teams responsible with the malaria program, with the EPI, with the TB program and so on. I think the, the kind of planning and finance function in the Ministry of Health can get a bit orphaned. So we need to think about how does that um, planning and finance function in the Ministry of Health operate? What capacity does it have? What functions it, is it meant to do, meant to have? Because that kind of strong fiscal coordination role inside the line ministry will make a Ministry of Health more able to uh, react to changing economic and social conditions. And it will be better able to make its case for more financing or reallocating financing with the Ministry of Finance as well. The eighth area is, you know, many African countries have quite decentralized um, health systems. And so making sure the decentralized um, system supports effective social spending. A Ministry of Finance or an agency close to the Ministry of Finance, like some kind of um, local government um, or fiscal commission, will have important roles in shaping how that system works. And there is a role for making sure that system is promoting uh, efficient and productive expenditures and not um, tolerating waste um, and, and um, poor quality spending at the local level as well. So there's that kind of custodian role of the fiscally decentralized system and making sure that supports social spending. Um, a ninth area is looking at procurement policies and making sure that they're fit for purpose for the health sector's needs. So we know that economies of scale, um, long-term framework contracts are incredibly important if health ministries are going to be able to get value for money 
from health um, from, from the health procurements, and it needs to the, the Ministry of Finance is going to be the ultimate have the ultimate responsibility for deciding whether the um, existing system is fit for purpose and allows the Ministry of Health to do that, or whether in fact it is impeding it. And the last item is designing health taxes to reduce the non-communicable disease burden. Um, now, I think in health financing discussions, I actually think too much of the discussion ends up being about the additional financing that these taxes might make available for the health sector. Because why is the health sector interested in these taxes? They're, it's interested in them ultimately because they are, they're on the like, WHO list of best buys for addressing um, non-communicable diseases. So I think there's a, my, my view on this is that, look, in an ideal world, you put these taxes in place, you get the health benefits, and you might get some extra revenue streams to the Ministry of Health. But I think if, if a Ministry of Health is struggling to engage a Ministry of Finance or a tax authority on these taxes, then I think doesn't an implicit deal make sense that, look, work with us to design these taxes in a health maximizing fashion, the Ministry of Health can bank the health benefits that we know those taxes will produce, and the finance side of the government can know that there's some extra revenue streams coming in as well. So there's 10 ideas for what ministries of finance can do for health without asking for more money. This is not a set of actions that is applicable in all times and places. It's a menu or a framework for thinking about how there can be better dialogue to find the solutions that will work for each um, individual country context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for just over five minutes. Um, <laughs> that, but uh, no, that was incredibly rich, um, rich points there. And I, th I think um, during the panel discussion as well, we can maybe bring those points back up, uh, present them for, for, for discussion later. I want to just now move on um, to the a, a presentation uh, we've got um, from the Global Fund. Yes, here we go. Uh, now, I'm not uh, uh, Dr. Natilla, but uh, I'm presenting on behalf. Um, and so we are going to talk a little bit about kind of the, the, su the support that our, the health financing department um, plays in terms of health financing reforms and actually, um, you know, why is this topic important on, on domestic financing of health? Um, so I want to just, just mention, you know, like, so, so as I said, you know, why is the Global Fund supporting um, the work on domestic financing advocacy? Why is it, why do we support ALM? Well, I think it comes from the base realization, you know, that, that we as an organization are never going to achieve our ultimate goal of ending HIV, TB and malaria without you know, talking and engaging on that broader financing discussion. We, as, as external financing, is never going to be sufficient to address, address these concerns um, and address the, these things. So mobilizing increased resources is right there front and center in our strategy, um, in, in our recent strategy. And there's you know, a, a more kind of comprehensive approach on, on health financing as part of that. And it talks about you know, domestic resource mobilization, that focus that we've heard about the more health for the money agenda to strengthen the focus on VFM, um, enhance economy efficiency, effectiveness. You know, there it's just it's not about just efficiency as well. There's kind of more domains to, to value for money um, as well. So that, that's kind of rec re recognizing that. Um, to look at leveraging blended finance and debt swaps, I'm going to present the next slide, which is going to show, you know, the financing outlook is, is not so good, um, you know, which, which we all know. So how do we make the most uh, of our limited resources in terms of, you know, working with our partners, uh, leveraging the work with, with multilateral development banks and, and so on? And then supporting the country health financing systems on in, in terms of sustainability, re reducing financial barriers, you know, there's a lot of discussion about national health insurance, and that comes up a lot. But how are we engaging with kind of some of the, um, you know, the, the government's uh, strategies on, on kind of the expansion of national health insurance? And where is, uh, you know, the place to um, kind of integrate HIV, TB and malaria uh, as, as part of those, if that's the, the, the way that the government are, are moving, for example? Um, so that's kind of the, the overarching framework where it fits in the strategy. It's kind of prominent and integrated, not just in, in our strategy, but in other kind of cross-cutting areas as well. Um, so there's, you know, there's work on our co-financing policy that we invest, we co-invest, 
um, using co-financing requirements. We promote the public contract with private providers. Um, and also we're looking at yeah, re reducing financial barriers to care and, and out-of-pocket costs. So um, as I mentioned, you know, moving on, there's macro challenges through 2023, and this has been covered quite extensively, but we see you know, rising debt distress in uh, surging food and prices and, and, and inse food insecurity, for example, revisions downward in, in expected gro growth and, you know, a reduction in government spend. The fiscal space is, is contracting. So there's less that we're, we're going to be able to, you know, have, but how do we support countries in, 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 to make the most um, of that? So that's kind of the, the, the background there uh, to that. It's one of the 10 strategic shifts that's been identified in the in the strategy. I mentioned that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, there's multiple dimensions to sustainability, as I mentioned, but obviously the work on domestic financing for health really is around that financial um, kind of aspect of sustainability and transition. And, and just a note on transition, you know, if you're a country, like a context, like, as, as uh, Dr. Lamboli mentioned earlier on Mauritius, well, if you're not getting um, kind of a huge amount of money, your kind of leverage to have the discussions with and, and open the doors with ministries of health and ministries of finance really is almost limited to your programs. So actually, the discussion on transition has to take place in advance. This is this kind of blending between sustainability transition. So you are kind of setting up the system, setting up the processes, you're strengthening the governance, supporting those kind of processes early on. So that when the amount of financing that you are supporting countries with is, is kind of larger, you, you kind of have already got that foot in later on down the, down the road. So we've kind of talked about the four um, areas of the ALM, um, and a, lo a lot of it actually aligns with the support from the department. So kind of looking at the more money um, agenda, and so we've supported a lot of the, the kind of DRM activities within countries, the blending and joint financing operations with the World Bank, with the multilateral de development banks. We spend, we also support a lot on value for money and the Devetta spend uh, discussion. So looking at procurement efficiency, efficient uh, integration into health benefits package, national health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, as I, as I mentioned. Then we're ensuring that it's aligned with national systems. So support to kind of look at making sure our support is on budget um, and how we're supporting the broader strengthening of PFM systems and then making it less dependent on external sources, um, which is kind of the ultimate goal uh, eventually, all leading to kind of improved health outcomes and financial sustainability. So that's kind of the, the broad areas of the, of the support um, we're doing. There's some examples as well. I won't go into, into too many details because of the time, but as I mentioned, this is, you know, the ALM work is our, is a key area of our work on domestic financing advocacy, and certainly the support for the National Health Financing Dialogues. We're then engaging in uh, a number of uh, areas within Nigeria, um, the enrollment of, of people living with HIV onto the health insurance scheme, Zambia, uh, likewise, the enrollment and subsidy arrangements for people living with HIV there and on uh, Zimbabwe engaging on the questions of, of sustainable human resources for health financing. So um, I'm sure afterwards as well, these slides will be uh, shared. So there's a lot of information on there um, that we can digest in your, your, uh, your own time. So I mentioned blended finance, uh, like the, the, for, for the Global Fund, kind of what blended finance is, is really this combining of grant resources with loans from development banks, banks to crowd in additional resourcing and drive financing towards critical strategic priorities. It's not about crowding out countries' own money, which would have gone to kind of national sponsors uh, or this fungibility thing. It's about also creating on-budget spend, um, looking at with a, with a focus, as we mentioned, on kind of building uh, resilient, sustainable systems for health, on UHC, PHC, so not just looking broad at, at the three diseases in isolation, but more broadly. And then it's also about um, public sector funds driven by national government budget holders as well, so engaging with the ministries of finance. Um, so that's kind of what it, what for us, uh, blended finance means. What it's not, as I mentioned, about the crowding out of, of resources, um, it's not about parallel structures, and it's not really about blending it with private sector 
resources or public private partnerships or capital markets and, and, and so on. So uh, that I think uh, takes us to the end kind of broadly. I think now we're moving on to a, pan a panel discussion with very um, uh, really experts in, in each area to, to, to speak um, about the issues of from the development partner side, looking at what can we do better to engage with ministries of finance, um, and so I would like to introduce uh, first up Regina Ombam uh, just to help moderate this panel. Uh, have we got enough chairs? Let me. So perhaps could we go to the ODI presentation, put up the 10 things again. That would be great, actually, for that. <laughs> great. So as I mentioned, so we've got Regina uh, Ombam, who will be moderating this uh, session I introduced previously. Um, we're also going to have uh, Dr. Mark Bletcher to come and join us uh, at the front. Um, as Tom alluded to, uh, Dr. Mark Bletcher is the South African National Treasury's Chief Director for Health and Social Development, um, a, a medical doctor by background uh, with a PhD in health economics from UCT. Um, so he will be our, our kind of first uh, speaker. We've got uh, Dr. Calypso Chalkadu from uh, who's my boss's boss. So, you know, I hope I did a good job. Huh? No, uh, <laughs> but uh, who is the head of the health finance department at the Global Fund, um, which uh, with a background as a trained clinician um, and also, uh, you know, a, a, a long illustrative career with uh, working with this, uh, the director of global health policy and senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, a professor of global health practice at Imperial College and visiting professor at King's College London, and also the founder and director of the International Decision Support Initiative. So um, thank you, thank you both uh, for joining. We've also got next uh, Dr. Collins Chancer uh, to join us. If uh, Colin, <laughs> is that okay? Thank you at the front here. Um, Dr. Collins is a trained health economist and health specialist with the Health Nutrition and Population Global Practice. Um, his PhD work examines fiscal sustainability of health systems in LMICs with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Collins. I hope that's an okay introduction. I've, I've... <laughs> and then next we've got uh, Michael Chaikin from the Gates Foundation. Uh, Michael Chaikin is a program officer on the primary healthcare team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, supporting governments to design, implement, and evaluate reforms to bolster health system performance. Um, so that, and then lastly, but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Kingsley uh, Frimpong. If we super, thank you for joining us, Kingsley uh, from the WHO is a program officer on the uh, primary. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> is technical officer of health financing and human resources for health, um, an institutional economist with extensive experience undertaking qualitative and quantitative analysis uh, for health system strengthening services. So, thank you. Um, I will pass over to Regina um, to lead the moderation. Thank you. And we'll. Thanks, Mark, for giving me the mic. This is not going to change the questions I'm going to pose to you. To the panelists, I just want to allow that you allow me to refer to you by your first names. Uh, of course, even if I do that, it doesn't mean it will change the way I'll ask questions. And uh, I'd really like to make this session very interactive. So I'll start off with you, Mark. Uh, and the first question is around uh, what I always learned when I was uh, 
a young economist trying to do the budget for the health sector. And I'd always be told, uh, always do that budget knowing that even if you present it to the, the finance ministry, the first word, words that you're going to hear is, I am not convinced. So I want you to just tell us in your own words, some reflections around uh, health spending from a treasury perspective. Mark? Do you need my mic? <laughs> um, gotcha. um, like if I could just make a few if, a few comments on, on that and maybe just one or two other issues pertaining to the presentation. Um, so afternoon colleagues are quite amazed to see so many people out on a Saturday afternoon and it's a rainy day. And welcome, welcome all to Cape Town. And thank you, Tom, for the for the um, kind and humorous words. Um, so if I can just just comment a bit more broadly, coming also onto your question. Um, so I, mean, I think it's it's really it's really important and wise to be thinking about the role of ministries of finance in budget process and in health spending and so on, because partly because many of the areas there are. Are, are treasury functions. If you look at, for example, in some cases, um, exclusively treasury functions. For example, in, in South Africa, only the Minister of Finance can introduce a money bill. Um, so issues like revenue raising and tax-based systems um, are exclusively Ministry of Finance functions. Program structures, many of the rules, the way the budgets are, are, are um, laid out are, exclu are exclusively treasury functions. Um, so engaging with ministers of finance is important and trying to find common grounds. Um, I think the areas that Tom mentioned in terms of the ODI, um, that list of 10 things are spot on. I just do want to say though that, you know, even though Regina's mentioning kind of the treasury problems with health and with health spending, that in Africa, I mean, I think Tom was a little cautious about leaving off the list, the issue about revenue raising and funding for health. Because in Africa specifically, um, there's a substantial problem clearly with health financing. I mean, we have probably a median a median financing of health at around six percent of government budgets. Looking at the WHO data from December uh, last year, and you know the, the the revenue to GDP ratios are very low in many countries. In many countries, the revenue raising systems are weak. Um, um, so. Many ministries of finance do need to be challenged in Africa to improve their fund funding. I mean, in Kenya, in, in many, many other countries. Um, I'm not sure how many of these other points, Regina. I have a number of points to, to make. Uh, no, don't worry. Okay. 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 I think I'll stand here so that I'll allow you to use my mic and we move very quickly. I think, Mark, you've really started off well by actually telling us that, you know, there's something that really needs to be done around uh, health spending. So I just want to go to Calypso uh, from her own assessment uh, as a partner. What do you think? What are your reflections about health spending? Right. Uh, <laughs> read some notes, but... Well, it's as as uh, Mark said and everybody said so far. It's tricky, right? I mean, we've seen uh, in in the presentation, Attila's presentation, Alex uh, kindly made uh, the reference to the the challenging macro situation, um, and things are probably going to get uh, harder before they get better. Um, so I think I think it's quite important that um, countries are supported in driving prioritization of health. And we've seen this already from the early data on budget allocation for, for this year, that uh, health is losing out to education, agriculture, and other sectors. And to some extent, that's to, to be expected given the uh, surge in funding during COVID. But what COVID also showed, I think, is that uh, all the progress we've made so far has been quite fragile. And unless domestic investment is, is sustained, um, I think the whole risks around pandemics, including the three diseases that the Global Fund is uh, uh, trying to address in the partnership are likely to 
um, well, not to be controlled. So I think if I may, perhaps three or four points, uh, we've talked about more money for health um, and to, to the point that Mark made, and that's quite important. Uh, Alex mentioned blended finance. There's been a, a, a summit in Paris a couple of weeks ago, uh, Macron and, and Motley convened, um, and there seems to be a lot of appetite to engage multilateral development banks that will ban more in um, climate, but also health or resilience. And I think it's important to see how we can work together with these institutions, and we are working with them increasingly. Um, there's also the more health for the money agenda. I talked about efficiencies, about allocation. Um, many of the points that Tom made about procurement, for instance, to improve uh, efficiencies. Um, how do we work on benefits package design? How do we work to integrate populations and interventions in a, an affordable way into benefits packages, which, as colleagues said earlier, have to be linked to budget, budgetary design, budget execution, because so far these packages in many settings are not, uh, well, not even costed, let alone budgeted for. But the same applies in many cases to national strategic plans, for instance, that drive our, our work. Uh, very often they're not properly costed and, and not very often are they linked to budgets. And, and again, I think that's, that's problematic and we want to do more in this space. Public financial management systems, including, I was very interested in the conversation earlier on pay for performance and how it's not about the incentives, perhaps, as much as it is about provider autonomy. So what can institutions such as the Global Fund do to support that devolution, given we operate at a very high level and then through our country coordinating mechanisms and, and principal recipients and so on. Um, and coordination, I mean, the whole session, what you've been talking about, Regina, on uh, the ALM, that's incredibly important. Uh, so that we all work together and we're not doing things um, that, that uh, well, that are not aligned, really. All partners uh, aligned with the AU and the priorities of the heads of state and the continent. But I'll stop there. Perhaps you'll come back. Thank you so much. I was just about to tell you to hand over the mic to Collins. And uh, Collins, I, I think earlier on you had talked about domestic resource mobilization. And I just want to throw that back to you again in terms of your reflections on health spending. Yeah. <laughs> as the World Bank, not okay. as Collins. Okay. Well, I mean, let me just start from there. And, and it, I think resource mobilization is something which we have all talked about. It's something which is very good, but also building enough from what uh, Mark was saying. Uh, if you look at ourselves in the midst of health, and I like the work you are doing, uh, going back to advocacy, because, um, um, and again, I'm glad that Tom put that as the last item, um, which, which talks about the, the health taxes, because there's this belief that there's money out there. So maybe from the World Bank perspective, what we normally look, look at is how the economy is doing. So for instance, if the micro fiscal uh, environment is poor, how then do we expect to mobilize additional resources? And it's something which we normally overlook. And of course, having worked in uh, Central, Southern, and Western, and Eastern Africa, we've tried some of these uh, um, uh, uh, approaches where you want to mobilize money, but it's not possible. So again, we need to uh, probably um, uh, do what we're supposed to do. Um, if we're supposed to uh, uh, provide healthcare, uh, which we're supposed to do that. I don't think, I think sometimes we spend so much time trying to mobilize resources which are not there. Um, we know already that um, um, the IMF has projected, the bank, World Bank has projected, and even from your own understanding, you'll see that, well, I think where we are, it's, it's impossible, but then we still want to do it. So I think what we don't normally do in the Ministry of, ministries of Health is to make a good case of what we need. I've been working in the Ministry of Health before, the main problem which you normally find is that uh, when it comes to making a budget, annual budget, one of the young guy, I would just have resources from the government. I would not know uh, how much is coming is going to come from uh, certain donors, and it comes very very difficult to be able to make. That's why the first point which talked about on budget is very important. We as partners sometimes we talk about you know alignment and the like, but when it comes to implementation, we don't do that. So when the planner is there in the midst of health, it becomes difficult to be able to make a budget which um, you know, links up to all the resources uh, which are available. There is no resource envelope 
as you think. It's very, very difficult. It's actually very lonely when you're trying to make uh, a budget each year. And when you start implementing that budget, that's when donor A, B, C, D start coming through with additional resources. And then if it is on budget, then you are lucky then it goes to parliament as a supplementary funding. If not, then it's, it goes through as, as fragmented. So I think maybe we should do more about, you know, trying to, 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 to do, uh, to work better, especially at implementation. We do have these meetings, donor meetings where we discuss, but the moment the meeting ends, someone will go and see the minister, another donor will go and see the minister, just like that. And we don't do a good job about that. Then we come and say, we're talking about efficiency. Is it even really true that we can even get anything out of what you talk about? Uh, let's, let's be honest. There is also a very, the envelope is so thin that um, unless we put all the sources together, that's when we may need to make some efficiency gains. But the way we are at the moment, I think it's very difficult and um, we need to, to think about all these things. I can go in on one, but- uh, Thank you, can... you, thank you, Collins. I think you can. I think you know I was about to stop you and that was very kind of you for handing over the mic to mic. So Mike, I have, uh, I mean, as, as a Gates Foundation, uh, I know there's a lot of work that Gates has done around data, evidence generation. What would you give as your perspectives? What are you seeing around your own reflections on, on, on information around health spending? Yeah, thanks very much, Regina. And before I address that, I wanted to offer just one bigger reflection is that I, I think it's actually a really positive development that we're having this discussion in the way we are. I'm not sure this event we've had this afternoon would have been possible with these institutions 10 years ago. Um, and it was almost 10 years ago that I met for the first time many of the people on this panel or in the room in the context of work really narrowly focused on questions of HIV financing and HIV economics backed by the Gates Foundation and other institutions. Um, or I met you, Regina, trying to do very HIV sustainability focused uh, study in Kenya about six years ago, again, backed by the foundation and the Global Fund. So the fact that we're actually having a conversation about health financing on its own terms, not forced through the lens of individual disease programs, um, I think is a testament to the progress that has happened at some of these institutions. It's not easy. Um, Calypso knows better than anyone how much of a, an upstream battle it is within a place like the Global Fund. Um, my predecessors at the Gates Foundation have also been fighting that fight. So I don't want to overly applaud us. We have a long way to go, but I think it's worth at least recognizing that we're, we're having a better conversation today than maybe we were a, a decade ago. Um, so on the question of what we're seeing at the foundation, I've been at the foundation for about four months, so I, I don't have a a deep um, reflection from the institutional perspective. Um, I think some of the questions today's discussion raised for me are, for those of us working for health-focused funding agencies or technical and normative agencies, what is our value proposition to ministries of finance? Um, Tom gave us this really nice kind of wish list for how can ministries of finance help us as the health sector do our work better. Um, I think the bank is probably, you know, a generation or two ahead of us in thinking about interfacing with those policymakers and devising um, strategies of support to help solve the problems that ministries of finance face, which I don't think among the health agencies we're really in the business of doing. And, and today raises the question of ought we to be? I, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. Um, I wish we had more people like Mark on this panel whom we could ask what is it that ministries of finance need from us as health agencies to help them address their pain points, either directly or indirectly. I think one of the things at the foundation we are trying to do with our partners in ministries of health to get at some of these issues indirectly is to support health ministries to execute their basic PFM functions better. Even before we get to questions of the, the return on the spending in, in terms of health gains, in terms of fiscal and economic gains, our health sectors completing their basic financial reporting on time. 
Are they providing visibility into the basics of how health funds are being spent, not just in an aggregate way, but at the subnational level, at the facility level? We've heard throughout the day some stories of, of progress many countries are making in that respect, but I imagine our colleagues in ministries of finance wish it would happen a whole lot faster. Um, and I think we, we see this more, more health for the money agenda as a prerequisite for the domestic resource mobilization conversation. Ministries of Health aren't packaging their asks well, but I'm not convinced finance officials even wanna hear the well-packaged ask if they have Ministries of Health as stragglers, as poor performers next to the other line ministries in budget execution and reporting. Again, those basic functions that even, um, even come before the, the more sophisticated way of, of building the case. Um, I'm happy to elaborate more generally to give a, a flavor of the work we're doing on health financing across sort of the raise, allocate, spend spectrum and, and um, cross-cutting work we do to generate evidence um, to support health accounts exercises, resource mapping exercises, to promote that donor alignment, whether the money's coming on or off budgets, um, to increase visibility and allocative efficiency, those kinds of things. I have many colleagues in the room who really lead our work in this space in a number of countries. Um, so as you ask me difficult questions, I'll be turning to them as well. But I, I sense you're coming for the next question. Yes. Regina, so I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Mike. I, I, I just want to move quickly to Kingsley. I, I think you're the WHO guy and all along we've known, uh, I mean, Minister of Health, WHO, Minister of Health, WHO. Mike has just talked about packaging our issues. Uh, from your perspective as a WHO, what, 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 what do you think are the things that actually make you think that the health financing agenda might not be well received within the Ministry of Finance for purposes of action? Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon colleagues. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, in 2020, uh, we conducted a study, political economy analysis in Ghana. It was just to, I mean, it was conducted ahead of establishing a UAC roadmap for the country. One major recommendation coming out of that study was the fact that when we met the Ministry of Finance as part of the process, the Ministry of Finance position was that Ministry of Health has been struggling to speak their language. And what does it mean? It means issue of capacity. It means not being able to demonstrate the return on, on the investments and so on and so forth. So the point here is that we have been supporting countries and I'm sure almost everyone in this room knows about the uh, system of health account, the health expenditure tracking. And this morning, we dedicated a whole period discussing how to institutionalize the process of expenditure tracking and data use. So evidence generation, yes, we've been supporting countries, but using the evidence for decision making has been so difficult. The issue of capacity has to do with the fact that in the ministries, even for those that have established health economics unit, where they are supposed to make business case justifications to the Ministry of Finance. And sometimes when I talk about resource mobilization or raising fine, uh, fine, 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 uh, resources for the health, it is really not about the general context of that, but it's really how are we packaging our request to the Ministry of Finance? And so for me, the issue of capacity, making sure that we have a system in place to conduct data analytics that will give us the return of investment language once we approach Ministry of Finance. It is really critical for us to do that. I'd like to also add that it is not just Ministry of Finance. We've gone beyond that to engage the parliamentary select committees on finance and health, because in terms of the budget process, the formulation starts from there. And so, uh, I have a lot to say, but I think this will be my initial submission in terms of the need for us to work closely with Minister of Finance and how to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to go back to Mark because the story from Kingsley is like that there's a language. There's a language they speak which finance doesn't seem to understand. 
and there's some packaging that they do, which probably once it gets to, to finance, it's not a package that even finance wants to open. So Mark, maybe you could tell us what are these things that you see as you try to open this health package? Well, maybe one point I could start with is that because we work with um, quite a few health departments in, in the different provinces and quite a few different vertical programs, that they the programs differ a lot in their ability to speak the language. And typically those programs that have, have worked with, with economists um, to develop their, their plans and their budget bids do much better. Um, because you know a lot of the health programs that People come from health, they don't necessarily have that financial or economic background. So, I mean, we've had many, many important programs that I can say in the last 10 years have never made a single budget bid. And it's partly because they don't know the language, they don't know the, the language. And I mean, some of them are quite important programs. I mean, like uh, global surgery, for example. You know, it's in increasingly surgeons are thinking glo global surgery and what that means for funding. Um, Recently, one starting to see um, global mental health emerging and, and mental health practitioners starting to be able to work with economists to put together these things. Um, HIV AIDS, which Michael was talking about, I mean, they were really early on this bandwagon. They understood a lot of a lot of economist support and 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 the donors helped that a lot so that they were able to speak that language much earlier. So, you know, I do think that issue of 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 um, Understanding the, 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 the treasury languages, but I don't know if colleagues have seen the video of the, I don't know the, the colleague's name, but he's a senior OECD professional. And in this video, he, he's been both the Minister of Health and he's been the Minister of Finance um, in, I think, the Netherlands. And so he, he interviews himself, he plays both roles. And, and it's really interesting to see, you know, the two hats. and. And you know, up pops the thoughts of each one as they speak to each other. But he's speaking to himself. And you know, I think I think what's kind of interesting is, you know, having worked in a Ministry of Finance for a long time, you know, it's not that ministries of finance are any better than ministries of health or necessarily any worse. You know, I mean, we're all human beings, it's just kind of people sit with different hats and they've got different kind of priorities. And you know, ministries of, of, of finance do need to to engage with all the departments. So they have, you know, they have all the departments coming with their budget pressures. So, you know, I think working together is just so important here. And but particularly in the African context, because you know, you can see some countries are moving very fast and they're developing very fast. And I mean, if you look at like the human resource shortfalls in health, I mean, like the shortfalls in numbers of say doctors and nurses, I mean they they're in the hundreds of thousands in certain countries and regions. And some countries are moving very fast to build you know, their infrastructure, their human resource, whereas others are really, really stagnant. You know, if you look at the, if you look at the Lancet Primary Care Commission report uh, last year, I mean, that looked at about 98 countries. Um, most of the lower income countries in Africa were spending about two to three dollars on domestic funding on primary health care. Um, and the, the, the largest funding sources for primary health care are out of pocket spending and donor spending. Um, I mean, it's really interesting funding, and I mean, and those are those are fundamental uh, kind of flaws in the domestic um, revenue raising and pooling systems. They don't really exist in those systems. But, you know, in in Africa, most of the primary care financing, particularly in the low income countries, is out of pocket. You know, which is not the best way of funding primary health care. So there's a lot of reforms that are needed and a lot of work to do. I hear you, Mark, but I still want to get some, I still want to nudge you people more. I need to get this understanding of speaking of the language. Calypso, we've heard people say, you know, we are not speaking the finance language. Do you have anything to tell us around this language barrier that makes us not get the funding? I don't know. I mean, I think the, the point that Colin's made about uh, being on budget, I think, and, and like what you mentioned about having come a long way, I think the more, well, who, who are we talking about here? I think um, the di different audiences, obviously, but I can see that um, uh, people within the Global Fund, for instance, are increasingly interested in understanding um, the language and uh, what on budget means and how it can accommodate within the systems of the global fund. I think that's a good thing and it's progress. So 
we just need to continue moving in that direction, right? Collins, anything around the language? I'm still pushing, pushing. Yeah, so, I want to hear. Yeah, so so now donors are demanding more for results, and uh, and of course, but then the problem is that then uh, like the like individual results. So when I say on budget, we want like the the complete picture because if you look at health, most of the problems which we have are not actually from the health sector. For instance, we have at countries which have at Korea, for instance, and for some reason, the ministers of health would want to have that budget all every year so that they resolve the Korea issue. Instead of going to the Ministry of Works, uh, Water and Development, we did it in one of the countries, I won't mention the name, where then when we went to the Ministry of uh, Works, we uh, rectified the sewer system and the water system, and then that problem was, was cut off. So there was a result there which means of finance could see, and then also it also impacted uh, um, on health because then there was no money spent each year on Korea, so things like that. So I think for me, like uh, when we say we also need to look at efficiency gains by uh, all the partners being on budget, looking at health system strengthening rather than health system support, I think that would be important because efficiency is very good. Of course, we're going to uh, have some form of efficiency gains within the health sector. But as long as even if you don't look at efficiencies at the point of resource allocation, we won't achieve much. So I think that is one of my points. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Collins. Before we go to Mike, I just want to come to my audience here and ask uh, this. We are still on this language and package thing now from the country perspective. I think most ministries of health actually have economists, finance people within their ministry. So what, what is really happening around this language and package that somebody in the audience who can tell us from a country perspective, Nigeria will always go first. <laughs> Thank you so much, Regina. So I'd like to say that what we understand in Nigeria about the language is the investment case. The Ministry of Finance wants us, they don't want us to say many people are dying, women are dying, children are, they want us to say how many, what is the implication of this in terms of, um, of like daily life adjustments, ratio, um, the economic loss, um, what does it translate to in, lock of, in the loss of the workforce? For example, this is like TB and HIV, you can actually estimate the number of um, you know, life years that are being lost and what it translates to economically, because we know TB and HIV, for example, affect the productive age group. So if you look at the epidemiology, you can see that most people that are dying are, or that are affected are between the young adults to like you know, middle aged people. So you can use it to make an investment case for health. So I think it's the investment case for health. And I think Mark also mentioned efficiency gains. So instead of just saying people are dying, one million, you know children are dying every year. It doesn't make sense an economist. What they want to hear is that what does it translate to in terms of the economic impact on the country? That's our understanding. And we've been trying to change this language. The challenge we've had is continuity and sometimes attrition. You train some people to be able to, and like you said, Ministry of Health should have economists that can actually make this investment case continuously every year. So what we see in Nigeria is that we make gains and then it drops because maybe some people, a cluster of people in the, in the system are left and there's nobody making this continuous case for help. So I think it's the investment case and then the efficiency gains being demonstrated in our language. We are getting the language. We are getting the language. We are hearing we need an investment case. Think well. I think those are the people who really think well around. Thanks for that. The other piece of this that we heard this morning at the direct facility financing session as well, and we've heard over and over in countries, is that if the Ministry of Health is not spending the budget that's given to them, why ask for more, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's back to uh, some of the service provider autonomy, but autonomy with accountability. So how do we work with Ministry of Finance and give them some language that this is how we're going to spend more? And we're going to spend more by giving some more autonomy, but there's going to be some accountability as well. Thank you. I think I want to go to the other side. We have uh, my sister. I think it's Gates Foundation, right? Is that Nigeria again? Yes. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> we love to share our experiences. No, I think for me, one of the salient things that came out was that in the in the health sector, it's very difficult for us to demonstrate what we've used the money for. 
Um, and that's something that even within the health sector, we're being asked to demonstrate impact. And we struggle because this is not really data that we know how to present well. Then even within the health sector, we understand that if you really want to tackle maternal mortality and under five, you need to go to the primary healthcare um, ground, right? But we see that inverted pyramid, meaning that we're spending about 40% on our tertiary institutions, about 30% in the secondary, and almost nothing. So in a recent scoping that you know, we commissioned in the Gates Foundation, the amount of government funding you know, from the state and local government to the primary health care facility was almost 0%. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And um, majority of the funding was from actually something called the Basic Health Care Provision Fund that comes from the federal level. So it's very difficult to be able to demonstrate impact at the facility level if we're not even really getting the funding. So that's the first thing. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pause just here. Pause there. I just want to go back to Mike before I get back. Mike, I know you're four months old, but prior to that, I, I know where you were before, and there are some experiences that you had around data and putting cases across. Are you able to just tell us some, like a point or two around what that means for us in the language? The two words we are dealing with here, language and packaging. Yeah, um, maybe a couple of thoughts on this. So one is, yes, I've seen instances where rigorous, robust investment cases or similar types of analyses have informed meaningful resource allocation decisions. Um, and that can only happen in environments where there are decision makers receptive to that type of input. So actually what I what I was gonna say before you posed the question that way, Regina, was that I think we, we're talking about language as if the technocratic interaction between a ministry of health and a ministry of finance is the only way momentum builds for increased resource allocation and better prioritization of those resources within a country's health system. So we can study, you know, I think the investment case process around the national HIV and TB responses here in South Africa provide really interesting lessons for how rigorous analysis um, on both the health and financial side um, can inform resource allocation decisions. I think we can look at um, a very language-minded choice in the early 2000s that the, the new minister of health in Mexico at that time, for example, made to hire a health financing director who was a graduate of the same economics program as the Minister of Finance, right? So this is really speaking the same language. They were trained in the same environment by the same people and had the same sort of tools and frameworks to understand the macro economy and, and health's place in it. Um, so, you know, are there opportunities, as Tom mentioned, not to just build the muscle with an existing Ministry of Health uh, budget and finance departments, but also bring in the kind of expertise um, that, that knows how to speak this language. The last thing I want to say, though, is that we need to be paying more attention to these alternate avenues of reform. That case in Mexico, recent health reforms in my own home country of the United States, these are coming on the back of landmark elections and political movements in which health and the lack of social protection are centerpieces of people's political campaigns. I think there are a lot of complicated reasons why development partners do or do not interact with the political sphere of, of countries. Um, and I defer to others in the room who know a lot more about that issue than I do. Um, but I do think we need to be much more mindful of the effects we have on the advocacy ecosystem in countries when we fragment our funding uh, across institutions, whether in government or civil society, that then dedicate themselves and in many ways feel incentivized to really only push very narrow issues rather than a coordinated health agenda. Um, my colleague, Katie Porter, who leads a lot of the advocacy work on primary health care at the Gates Foundation, likes to tell the story of how when they brought together civil society organizations from across the foundation's portfolio in Kenya, one of the things they were hearing over and over was that these organizations were running into each other all the time in the halls of parliament, 
to talk about family planning, to talk about HIV, to talk about TB, to talk about maternal and child health, but they were never working together. No one had ever given them funding or a space or a mandate to work together on funding for health or funding for primary health care. And so this is just another one of the, the really nefarious consequences of the way the funders among the developing partners have fragmented our flows of funds, not just to the programs and service delivery, but to the civil society space as well. And I think we need to sort of do some introspection and think differently about these alternative pathways to, to movement building and, and revenue mobilization, um, which again, in the context where the technocratic discussion can have legs, great. And, and we have the proof of concept that when matched with economic and financial expertise that is resourced, health programs can get better at making that case. Let's do it where it makes sense, but let's not ignore these other opportunities and pathways. Thank you so much, Mike. I think, Kingsley, I want you to go back to all these discussions that we have had so far. And there's one aspect around decision makers. You know, we've talked about the packaging, the language, but the decision making, how does it also affect the way uh, health uh, is financed? Now, I want, not, I want you to speak as Kingsley, not as WHO. It, it would be difficult to do that, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, in the first place, I just want to say that the submissions coming from my sisters from Nigeria is spot on. That's basically what they meant by the language. So I'm just quoting a statement coming from the Deputy Minister of Health when we had this uh, study. I have requests coming from over 15 ministries. In the absence of budget allocation formula, I need to be convinced why I should allocate resources to the health sector. And so the idea of not speaking the language is coming out of the fact that he has limited resources. And just as we have in so many uh, countries within the region, the Afro region, budget allocation formulas are not available. So decisions are based on your ability to convince a, a finance minister to make a, an allocation to you. So for, for me, it's, it's really about sustainability in terms of the capacity to put together the financial data, the epidemiological data, the programmatic data together to make a, 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 a good sense to, to, to the ministry and that support their decision making. I don't know whether I've been able to do that as Kingsley. You've done it very well, Kingsley. I think there was a hot, there was a burning hand somewhere. I just want to go to the audience on that side. Did it just drop? It looks like it was in a WhatsApp group and just left. So I'll go to Jonathan. Thanks, Regina. I'm also really burning, but I'll keep it very short. Um, this whole conversation has been a one-way conversation. How do we all learn to speak finance? Uh, and that's hugely problematic. I'm glad to hear Mike talking about advocacy silos and because civil society who've been advocating in, say, SRHR and HIV and others for decades, and we owe the HIV response to civil society, did not win it through learning to speak finance. They, they won it through many other political on the streets and various other places. And the, the problem is when we all learn to speak finance, then we only think finance. And so then we have UHC systems that are being designed on morbidity, mortality, qualies, dailies, burden of disease. Pregnancy is not a disease. So if we're talking about a life cycle of adolescence, all of the upstream preventative stuff is, is, it disappears when you only talk finance. Um, and because then you do the wrong epidemiological things and make the wrong decisions. So I really, I, I, I do want to learn to speak finance. I'm, I'm studying it now. But I think, I think we should also not kind of emasculate the areas where civil society and others have been good at speaking politics and speaking community. And we must teach finance to speak a bit of that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to go back to my panelists and... Uh... I know we could go on and on about what to speak. So we are living here knowing that we need to speak health, we need to speak finance, we need to speak community, we need to speak civil society. 
But I'll start with Calypso, my sister, uh, to just give us something around this whole issue of strengthening financial su sustainability from the Global Fund perspective. What does it mean? And as you do that, also just give us your parting shot. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. I mean, I, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start and finish perhaps with my parting shot, and maybe that covers the first part of your question. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about data. Um, about the how empowering information is, and when we don't know what um, is being spent domestically, um, and a lot of the time, even globally, the different financial flows, pandemic preparedness and response is a good example of how chaotic spending has been from different sources. When we don't know that, then it's very difficult, it's impossible to link it to outcomes and results. And so you can't make a case for or against something. And I think I think that's absolutely critical. And because we've talked a lot about budgets. How can we go back to budgets? How can we work through budgets to have the programmatic conversation together, not at different points in time? First we do it, then somebody else does. <clears throat> and how do we move away from these expensive extractive exercises of domestic and, and global financing so that these systems are part of the country, the, the DNA of decision makers in country, they're not an optional extra that somebody's financing from the outside. They're absolutely needed and they're there. And then the external partners use them because they need them too, but they don't drive that extractive exercise, that culture of data for data's sake. And I think unless we get to that point, data will never be useful. And then we won't be able to make a case. And we can see this in the current climate conversation where the whole climate debate includes health as an outcome and this is good but it's also bad because we can't make that case now in the global scene uh, because again we don't know we don't know what value for money is we don't know how efficient how equitable the distributive effects our colleague just mentioned we don't know that because you don't know who's spending how much on what and uh, unless we get that right i think it would be extremely difficult to uh, to have meaningful conversation Thank you, Calypso. I think I'll go to uh, Kingsley. I want you to just uh, give us a little bit of insights around uh, what Tom presented on, on, on uh, resource forecasting, particularly from the health perspective and how that reaches uh, the finance ministry, how it has been, and at the same time, also give me your parting shot. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. I would like to look at it from a different perspective, but I'm sure it will come back to the same question. Um, so I was tasked to look at one country within the Afro region, and I selected Ghana. So I, for, just by way of background, for those of you who are aware, uh, the National Health Insurance has been running since 2003 in Ghana. And uh, in theory, there is an earmark coming out of social security. So those in the formal sector will contribute. And those in the informal, of course, for the general population will also be paying value added tax. So the issue of earmark, raising resources through value added tax is there. Through this process, uh, we've actually recorded benefits in terms of the assets, quality, coverage, financial risk protection, but there are still challenges re re relative to the way this whole revenue is managed. And with your permission, I just want to quote something uh, just to bring back to the question of engaging Ministry of Finance relative to some of the issues we, you, you just raised. So um, the National Health Insurance Revenue Challenge is large and increasing, which worsens the proportion of compensation. Oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so um, we, we are saying that we need to, um, sorry, sorry. So it leads to um, out-of-pocket cost and hampers movement towards UAC. Concrete efforts are needed to increase the amount, timeliness, certainty, um, fairness of revenue forecast collection and uh, transfer. Now, if you look at the earmark, the value added earmark, the, mini the Ministry of Health 
sorry, Ministry of Finance has gone ahead to establish another act, which is called the earmark funds capping. And so in theory, you see that your VAT is about 2.5, which is going into the national coffers. But the ministry has come up with another act, which is counterproductive. So in effect, the National Health Insurance Fund is not getting the full amount of value added tax coming out of the collections. I don't know whether I'm making sense. So what the new health financing strategy is proposing to do by way of strategy is to engage the ministry for us to see how best to negotiate and increase the earmark that has been capped from 25% to an amount that will meet the requirement of National Health Insurance Authority. So what is my point? My point here is that there is the need for, uh, for the development partners to engage Ministry of Finance to address issues such as this. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, the engagement is usually driven by some of the strategic uh, uh, priorities that have been identified by the countries. So in this case, we have the national health policy, the USC roadmap, the national health uh, financing strategy, public financial management act, procurement act. These are the, the documents that will drive the discussion between Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Health. So that is always the starting point. I don't know whether that's, that addresses the issue of uh, engagement with Ministry of Finance. It does. Do you have a parting shot for us? So um, I, I think we need to strengthen the engagement be between Ministry of Finance. Um, as WHO, we have been trying as much as possible to build the capacity of colleagues in the Ministry of Finance as well for them to understand the health sector as well. So if you look at the advanced health financing for UAC courses, deliberately, we, we've been selecting folks coming from the ministry, especially the health financing desk, for them to participate to understand the broader health financing perspective. Because most of them are development economists, health financing, and even the health itself, the architecture, they need to understand all of that. We've also established um, a partnership with the University of Ghana School of Public Health for us to uh, train folks in Ministry of Finance to address the issue of capacity. So they are earning health economics in uh, masters in health economics, so as to be able to support the ministry, in the business case justification. I think this is what we need to be supporting. And as partners, we continue to do that to build the capacity within the Ministry of Health to be able to make the business case justifications needed to uh, raise additional resources. So that would be my parting statement. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go to Mike just to give us some insights around this whole aspect of expenditure reviews, expenditure controls, the way Tom presented it and what that means in this space in terms of our health financing agenda. Sure. And add your parting shot after you've answered that question. Yeah, I, I really appreciated um, Tom's framing that positions ministries of finance to, to assume some sort of intellectual and operational leadership and responsibility for how line ministries are performing. Um, because if the Ministry of Finance doesn't provide this kind of scrutiny and review on both the planning and the spending side, in a lot of countries, no one else is gonna do it. And as Calypso said, there just often aren't the data available at all or in a timely enough fashion or in a transparent enough fashion for um, actors outside of that finance health nexus to play a role either. Um, to me, this points to one of the really exciting possibilities in the digitalization agenda, um, new and different technologies providing ways to capture transmit, consolidate, 
and analyze data faster, perhaps with more quality, um, and, and put it in front of people who can derive insights and take different kinds of decisions, perhaps better decisions than they've been taking in the past. I also think it's important we resist magical thinking about this, just deploying a whole bunch of digital systems in, in a particular context without a lot of care about how they work together, the burdens we're placing on um, health workers and others in the system to interact with these tools um, can also lead to a lot of problems. Earlier, Marie-Jean from ThinkWell, the, the country director for ThinkWell, Burkina Faso, was talking about this digital ecosystem uh, initiative there that the ministry is really spearheading, and, and we're taking quite a keen interest in helping them to pilot this idea of putting multiple digital tools in just a couple of districts and figuring out ways for them to interoperate, figuring out ways to bring data from across those systems that generate and capture not just financial data, but also health and operational data and use insights drawn from across those different kinds of data to uh, enable more effective decision-making. And we're gonna see how that goes. It's, I think it's a really important question. Given we're at a research conference, I think this is an area where we really need the research community to help us learn more and learn faster about how this can work under what conditions what holds it back. I don't know if we still have any researchers in the room here at the end of the day, but that, that's one request I would make um, just on behalf of the community of people interested in this and, and looking to fund this. My other parting shot is on a slightly different topic, but because Kingsley briefly mentioned national health insurance in Ghana, I think we as development partners, the health financing and economics research communities, we're probably in the early stages of a, a pretty big reckoning on health insurance. Um, the reality is that very few countries on the African continent have achieved even modest levels of enrollment or coverage through national or social health insurance systems. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to reconcile what the evidence tells us about why that's not happening and, and the structural reasons why it's going to continue to be really difficult in many low and lower middle income countries on the one hand, and then on the other hand, what it is many governments are choosing to do. Um, and so we as partners need to figure out how we respond to that situation and the extent to which we try to meet countries where they are and, and be supportive of policy outcomes that are, as I said, increasingly misaligned with what evidence might suggest are good directions. Um, I also think that we need to do a lot more deep thinking um, through consultation, through research on what the alternatives are for revenue starved systems that are looking for ways to bring more money into health, looking for ways to pool that money in ways that enable um, strategic purchasing and driving efficiency and performance. I, I don't know that we are actually in a very good position right now to offer concrete alternatives into that political discussion. Um, and that's that's a big challenge for all of us. Thanks, Mike. I want to go to Collins. I think so much has been discussed on other aspects, but there's this area of accountability that Tom also touched that also looks at governance and the likes in, in health financing. Uh, what would you give us as some of the things as uh, World Bank is thinking around this whole thing of accountability? In, in, in the health space and also give us your parting shot. Okay, yeah, sure. I think um, this morning, I think there was a, a huge discussion on strategic purchasing uh, PFM. I think if you have noticed of late, we emphasize more on that. Um, for instance, um, um, over the years, there, was, there have been a lot of uh, resource-based financing or other, other countries they call the performance-based financing PBF. Um, they have worked in some countries, in other countries they have not worked as much. And of course, what has been noticed is that, of course, um, um, it's also important to look at issues of uh, public financial management. Uh, so there's a unit dedicated towards that. There's also a unit dedicated towards governance and of course, research. So I think uh, looking at all those issues and also uh, given our comparative advantage um, with regards to discussions with the Ministry of Finance, 
being our brokers, were able to uh, actually um, uh, forecast or probably know how much uh, resources would come through the country. Uh, and then of course, how much goes to the health sector and how that is used through our public expenditure in use. I think accountability will be important uh, to make some efficiency gains. Um, I wouldn't talk so much about human resources because as you know, um, the, it ranges sometimes from 55 to 80%, in some countries, 90% of the health budget. So already when, when being a health provider a planner, when, when I look at the budget, which 90% uh, goes to human resource, then I even draw back because what sort of efficiency gains am I going to make from there? Because I cannot cut people's size. So the only thing I was asking a question in the morning is that try to look at absenteeism. But again, the construct of the words in absenteeism mm. uh, are quite, uh, you know, not very clear, quite vague, because there is also a reason why someone was absent. So of course, we can look at that, try to incentivize the health workers, but you would need money to incentivize those health workers for them to work more effectively. So of course, we can play around that somehow, and then also look at the drug budget. Again, there's a lot of people right there. And then it ends there, believe me or not. Uh, you can talk about technical efficiency and stuff like that, but it's very, very difficult to organize the health system overnight. So then um, uh, the discussion then centers around how do we then engage with Ministry of Finance to, to have uh, additional resources. Uh, and again, the discussion not more about mobilization, maybe about um, uh, what you're talking about, dialogue from Ministry of Finance point of view, and also for the, the NGOs, they can help us to advocate for health, similar to what we did during the, the COVID-19. And when the resources come through, then there's more accountability towards that. And then we could um, um, make some gains. So in a nutshell, I think uh, uh, PFM, I think that is uh, the buzzword for now, making sure that there's improved governance uh, for health. Uh, in this case, uh, particularly looking at uh, the PFM issues. Um, my part in short, uh, <laughs> There are quite a number of them, but probably- I just need a quarter of it. <laughs> he's already talked about it. Um, I'm, I'm going also to probably just to, to leave something for him to think about. Um, a number of countries, because of what we've discussed, the gender in fiscal space. And if you have noticed now, the two ways which have come through, uh, resilience, when I was looking at sustainability, uh, not so many people are talking about it. Now everyone's talking about sustainability. Maybe I should look for another uh, new word. So, but what does, that, what does that mean? It's not really a technical matter because some people would say PBF doesn't work, it's not sustainable and other sorts of reforms. But of course it works, but it's just that probably the countries don't have money, right? To be able to, to implement it the way it should. So, um, so if you're thinking of uh, alternative ways of financing the health system, what are those alternative ways? The macro fiscal space is dwindling. So what do we do? So countries are looking at insurance, of course, not on the strategic purchasing point of view, but to be able to raise more money. My country, Zambia, is implementing something. I, I, I've, I've been interested to see tomorrow what, what has come through. But a lot of countries are coming through that. So what do we do as development partners? Do we just look away because um, insurance has never um, uh, improved UHC? Or do we um, try to help them somehow? because some of the countries are growing from low income to middle income. And if you look at the uh, out of pocket expenditures, others are 40, 45%, which means that you may probably introduce something which may try to reduce those uh, out of pocket expenditures. And then there's a foregone care. So the question is, much as it doesn't work in the very commerce, what do we do? We just look on the other side i don't think so, so i think that I, think, yeah. I, I don't think so we can't look on the other side i just want to tell you that that is a very good parting shot and i just want mark you know you're the last guy we are going into a tango dance between ministry of health and ministry of finance somebody's missing some steps and making the dance very difficult what do you think we should do and also give us your parting shot Okay, uh, well, thanks very much for, uh, for the session. And you know, I think it highlights a, a very important part of the health financing um, agenda. So, I mean, the existing um, health financing systems in Africa are very fragmented. And Calypso talked about 
you know, needing to build it into the DNA of countries. So building it into the aspects of the national financing systems and institutions, the integrated supply chains, the way primary care functions, uh, common financing pools, mixed public-private uh, delivery platforms, et cetera. Now, many of these things you can't do without the Ministry of Finance. Um, I mean, if you look at, for example, the, the, the kind of debates at the moment around sustainability and transition, which are very, which are very popular in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the donor communities, the multilateral, and you, know, you can't have these discussions without the Ministry of, of Finance. And so, and in many ways, Ministers of Finance don't want to engage in those kinds of debates because you know, the, the, um, the, you know, they're perverse incentives for them to maximize that, that financing. So it's better to actually, you know, start these discussions with ministries of finance and i like kingsley's point about building capacity in ministries of finance i mean i've i've heard a number of young budget analysts in ministries of finance around the world who who are really starting to think about health because you know they've learned about it they're starting to think about it and so i think building capacity building um these relationships i don't think you know although i must say my, my own boss did once tell me mark you always talk you're always talking about these people who are dying but um but in, in general, my experience has been that actually most ministries of finance do care about health status. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, but, but you know, these are difficult discussions and, um, you know, you, one can't do them without the Ministry of Finance. So, you know, if you're going to change the DNA, you've got to do them and you've got to do them slowly, but you've got to do them progressively. Thank you so much. I think I think we need to give them a big round of applause. This has been a very, very interesting and good panel. And I think what we are living with here is that uh, we all need to know that uh, re resources are scarce and therefore smart decisions have to be made around how to, to, to distribute, to spend them. So as the health sector, we really need to have our data right, our information right, so that when we go to discuss with the Ministry of Finance, we're actually ahead of the game. So I think we have learned that uh, there are a few steps in that tango dance that we really have to get right if we have to really entertain people well. I want to thank you all for really staying in and thank you. Back to Alex. And thank you to our moderator there, Regina. And thank you indeed to all of the speakers throughout uh, this marathon session from, from 1.30 onwards. Um, and thank you to yourselves as well for, for staying uh, throughout the course. So yeah, just another hand of, uh, a round of applause to you all and uh, look forward to the discussions. Thank you.